depleted. And more. Sensation of a wholly different sort rushed through her. So much feeling it arched her back, filled her and filled her, until she could no longer breathe without drawing in more. Magic. So much fucking magic. More than she'd ever felt in her entire life, and it lived inside, sparking, brushing against her heart and lungs, stretching her to the point of pain. It scared her for a moment, and she resisted, trying to read it before she let it in any further. But it kept coming, more and more, until she drowned in it. And yet there was no end to it. The roar of it filled her ears, greater and greater. It took over, smoothing things out in its wake. She let it go, let it settle in. Once she stopped resisting, the sharp slice against her ribs eased. Kendra? Max held her upper arms, his face close to hers. Come back to me right now. When she opened her eyes, he jerked back, a growl on his lips. And she answered with a growl of her own. Where had that come from? Panic threatened, but somehow being with Max calmed it, kept it at bay. Something loomed, big, life-changing. Inside her belly there was a rumble, an expansion that felt as if her entire being was stretched until she couldn't stand it. Thankfully, at last, it settled. Max sat up, eyes wide, watching. Kendra, what is it? The rushing in her ears muffled the sound, muffled what he said, though his lips moved, and she noted the concern on his face. He reached for the phone, and she shook her head. She didn't know what the fuck was going on, but it wouldn't be helped by a phone call. Deep within, there was a sort of knowing, but she couldn't connect with it. She was not one anymore, but two, which wasn't accurate either. Time stretched as she floated disconnected and yet not. And then it exploded. The world lived in color and sensation on a wholly new level. She could smell everything, everything. For long moments, she simply breathed, in, out. So much sensory input, she had to let it wash over her before it drove her insane. Instinct was there and she grabbed it, let it take over, and once she did, the waves diminished and she went with it, rather than let it threaten to drown her. She turned her head, opening her eyes, and caught Max looking utterly stupefied, standing next to the bed where she crouched. Gingerly, she moved, realizing how different it was to move with four legs instead of two, with the mass that had to be triple what she normally had. Her cat was in charge, reminding the human to back off and let her be in charge. Because she was curious, fascinated, and stunned, the human part of herself stepped aside and let the cat lead. The cat was satisfied by this. She was still Kendra, and yet not, more than what she'd been. But the cat was not interested in any distinctions as she sprang from the bed and headed toward her man, toward the man within which her cat lived. He touched the cat, fingers digging into spots her cat liked very much butting against his thigh for more. The man knelt, rubbing his jaw along hers, and satisfaction rumbled deep, vibrating outward. This was hers. Come back, Kendra, he whispered in her ear, and suddenly she was there, back in her human skin, his arms around her. Holy shit. Her entire body trembled, muscles spasming, the burn of a great deal of hard physical activity pulsed through her muscles. He picked her up like she was light and settled with her in the bed again. W what happened just now? I was a cat, a, a jaguar. Like you. She reeled with it, with the wonder and excitement of what had happened, the utter miracle of it. Oddly, there was no fear, just a sense of rightness, of being what she was supposed to be. And so she went with that. He held her tighter a moment, breathing her in in a way she understood on a totally different level now. I have no idea. What just happened shouldn't have happened. He rubbed against her, that low purr vibrating through her body. My cat likes it. I've taken the change. I don't know how, but hello, big giant furry cat just a few moments ago. She wasn't upset as she told him this, confused, caught off guard, as she hadn't really thought about the change at all, and now it was there. That can't be. 
I can't transfer this to you with a marking bite. It didn't break the skin. I wouldn't do that to you, not without your permission. He licked over the bite he'd made, sending pleasant tingles straight to her clit. She laughed, hugging him. I'm not mad, just, well, sort of surprised, I suppose. I know you didn't do this on purpose, and while I tend to scoff at the idea of fate, it's certainly a recurring theme with us, isn't it? He kissed her neck and her cat telegraphed images to her, satisfied, pleased images. She likes you, my cat. He exhaled. My cat likes you, too, and certainly likes that you've got a mate for him as well. He laughed, but it was careful, and she hurt for him. Turning to face him fully, she took his face in her hands. I hadn't planned on this, but I hadn't planned on you, either. Plans aren't life. Life just happens sometimes, and this is where we are. I'm on board. Do you understand? This doesn't hurt us. It strengthens us. I know this down to my toes. And she did. She also knew her magic had changed, deepened, and strengthened. She was a wholly new kind of witch. Something else. My magic has changed. I'm filled with a totally different sort of energy now. Max's emotions were all over the place, good ones, definitely, but they were a tumult in his belly. Relief mainly ruled then, as she assured him she was all right, even pleased with this shift in their relationship. Christ, what a beautiful cat she was, tawny gold with black rosettes, big green eyes. His cat, and the man, approved of this. For better, or worse. Had he made her less safe? His phone rang his father's ring, and one he couldn't ignore. I have to take it. She nodded. Yes, you do. He scrubbed hands, hands that smelled like her, over his face before he answered. His father, in full alpha mode, bellowed into the receiver. You did not have permission to change anyone, Max. Why is there suddenly another cat in my jamboree? Poppy, he started out, not knowing much himself. So he just told his father what happened. His father paused, weighing all the options. Max knew, certainly not missing what a huge coup this would be to the Jamboree's power, that Max could bring the cat into another person without even breaking the skin. His mother would see that right away. She was savvier in some ways than her mate. Max had learned from the best, growing up with them as an example. Without hesitation, he would use this to keep the others in the Jamboree back and respectful of his woman and of his position. His cat knew politics just as well as the man did. Interesting. I'll get Gibson on it to get some answers. Truthfully, I've never heard of something like this. Mommy, either. There are elders. We'll speak with them, too. I feel her, my new cat. I suppose tomorrow we'll be celebrating more than you and my new daughter marrying, eh? Be here early. We have to talk. Bring Kendra. He hung up without another word and Max tossed the phone into a drawer. Max turned back to her, his lovely woman. Magic flitted around her as always, like dust motes in a shaft of sunlight. But now, now his own energy connected, reached out, and caressed. He found his voice enough to speak to her. I don't know what to say. Her face fell, and he realized she'd been nervous about his reaction. He quickly moved back to her side, touching her, stroking over those long, pale limbs, so strong and feminine. No, this is amazing and wonderful and more than I'd hoped for. Don't think I'm not thrilled, both to be joined with you and to have a cat, too. She nodded, rubbing herself against him, taking his comfort. His cat eased back, though the man felt the slap for being careless of his partner. I just don't know how it happened or what it means. I worry about you. I have the number for the witch who mated with the wolf in Gabe's pack. I should call and see what the results of their bonding were. Gabe said he didn't take a wolf, but maybe later? I don't know, but he might have information we could use. You're awfully matter-of-fact, he said, following her as she headed for his bathroom. What else can I do? He leaned against the door jamb as she moved, pulling out towels, knowing where he kept everything. That pleased him a great deal. I could be upset, which is silly, because, well, because I'm not. Maybe it's because I'm already different, already not quite human. Maybe it's because my cat trusts yours, and that's keeping me mellow. 
I don't know. What I do know is that freaking out never solved a damned thing. Obviously, I have questions. I wonder how my magic will work. Clearly, it's different now. I wonder what it'll mean to Renee, who made the choice not to change. I worry about your family, and I don't want to mess with your status. Fuck that. Listen, if you want me to be brutally honest, it strengthens me. You're not only a witch, which brings me status. You've taken on a cat. And she came to you in her own, totally improbable way. My cats will see this as a sign that fate meant you to be at my side. They will see you as my destiny and as the destiny of the Jamboree. She turned to him, a smile on her face. I prefer brutal honesty any day. I'm not fragile, Max. I need to know the details. I can't help you if I don't know the details. Of course he forgot what he was going to say next, as she bent to turn the water on in his shower, and the curve of her pussy caught his attention. I haven't had you from behind yet, he murmured. She looked back over her shoulder at him, mischief on her mouth. Bracing her feet apart, she leaned forward and gripped the side of the tub. What's stopping you now? He should have resisted. But when he sank back into her heat, he couldn't feel guilty, especially when she arched, pushing back to meet his thrust. His cat wanted to roar with satisfaction at the primal act of possession, at the way she reacted to his touch. He wasn't ready for her cat, though, at the ferocity of her response to his. He needed the support of the wall, held on as everything she was filled him, settled in and took over. He might have marked her with his teeth, with his seed and his intent, but she marked him just the same. And when he came, he fell into her totally. She owned him in a way he doubted he'd ever be able to articulate fully. Gentle hands soaked her up as she leaned back against him. She didn't bother opening her eyes. Instead, she experimented with her newly enhanced senses. This is amazing. Part of the magic I work is called other sight. Anyone could see it if they could toss aside the barriers we erect from birth to close out all the external stimulus. Anyway, it's a lot like this. Do you see like this all the time? She paused as he soaked her pussy, detouring to play against the barbell. Answer this first he murmured. What made you pierce yourself this way? I came out of a shitty marriage with a lot of frustrated sexuality. I repressed it for years, but it's not natural to do that. We're all sexual beings. So I sort of threw myself into a sexual reawakening. I got the navel piercing first before I'd married, and I remembered liking the edge of pain. I saw a clitoral hood piercing in a movie. Yes, a porn movie, she laughed. And I liked how it looked. The place that did my tattoos also had a piercing station. I gave it a try. Hmm. Well, my cat's not so thrilled with some strange man with his head between your thighs, playing with your clit. But I do like the results. It was a woman. Even better. The other humans I know who've taken the change, and there aren't many, we like to keep to ourselves. Say it's like all your senses are at twelve. As for what I see like... I've never seen any other way, so I don't know how to explain it. I see the inner light in people. I can sense a lie. I know when you're turned on because your body heats up and your pussy gets sticky for me. He said the hottest stuff. What will happen tomorrow? Are you in trouble with your father? No. We have to get permission to change a human. I didn't get that. But he can feel the birth of a new cat into his jamboree. He knew you'd transformed because it was another being he was connected to and responsible for. My mother felt it as well, but I didn't lie. They know I have no reason to lie. So I'm not in trouble at all. They're going to want to speak with us tomorrow before the dinner, so we have to arrive early. Great. She hoped things wouldn't get worse because of this. The dinner will be far more than normal dinner now. You have to understand that. I've marked you which means we're married, as I explained. This will be a huge celebration because you're my wife, and I'm next in line. On top of that, you've taken on a cat, and at the end of the evening, you'll transform. Nothing like a first meeting with your family, turning into a wedding party and a meet-the-new-cat party. No pressure or anything. He kissed her. It'll be just fine. You were born to be right here, right now.
Trust that and trust me. We'll have to work on you making the choice to transform, rather than have it take over when you aren't ready. You'll need to change with the other cats in the Jamboree present. It's part of your ceremonial and physical entry into the Jamboree as a member. I'll be with you, as will my father. He's your alpha, and he'll guide your cat forward. It's hard the first few times for the newly changed. It sucks that I've got to deal with these messed up witches. I'd love to spend all my time experimenting with these changes. She turned in his arms, kissing his chest. We've got time. You'll have more physical strength now. My cat is comforted in part by that. We'll deal with the witches and then get on with our lives. He helped her out, handing her a big towel to wrap up in. You seem disappointed that I'm not upset, she teased. He paused, taking her arm and turning it. Gerida, look. She glanced down and saw the slice in her arm was gone. Cool. His look of surprise melted away into a smile. It is, actually. Chapter 10 Max checked in every few minutes, just seeing how she was feeling, which amused her. He seemed befuddled and sweetly happy that she'd accepted him and this change. She'd meant it when she'd told him earlier that she never found much point in railing against the random chaos that fate often threw in your path. In truth, she felt satisfied, safe, comfortable in her own skin. Part of it, she imagined, was from him. Max was the kind of person who just went through his life totally sure of himself and his place. This was endearing, even when he was a pushy butthead. She'd been loved over her life. Rosemary loved her, definitely. Renee did, her family did, but that part of her that had felt unmoored wasn't unsettled anymore, because she did belong in a way she simply didn't question. That stability of thought enabled her to look honestly at her life and know for certain she'd always belonged to someone. Still was a daughter, a sister, a granddaughter, and now, unexpectedly enough, a wife. She began to laugh and he looked up from his computer where he'd been working for part of the morning. Should I be worried? I was just anticipating the look on Beth's face. Makes me want to rub my hands together with glee. You're now a higher rank than she is. That ought to make you giggle some more. Sadistic woman. She hurt my sister. I don't like that. He looked up from the screen again. I don't either. This isn't going to be totally easy. You know that, right? Galen will be behind you, as will Renee, Gibson, Armando. Pretty much everyone but Carlos and Beth. She waved a hand as she stood. <sighs> Don't care. I have things to do. I need to work on some lesson plans. How about I meet you at your parents' at two? How about no? I thought you were going to move in here. I am. I just figured it would take some time to get that all organized. In the meantime, I still have a job and stuff. I have to water my plants and do laundry. I'm also totally in need of some maintenance. I'm sure you'd love me with hairy legs. After all, you're all furry sometimes. But I need some girl time. Gibson told me to inform you he'll get you all boxed up and moved in one day. You're safer here, so he has an ulterior motive. Listen here, bossy. I need to be, you know, consulted on this stuff. Yes, yes, I agreed to move in here. And why not? Hot cock on tap whenever I want it. He laughed. It's a big-ass house. There are, like, super bodyguards all over the place. You have a great view, and when I get my car, I can park it in a garage. So, all in all, I support that. But don't think that just because I'm furry now, and your mate, or wife, or whatever you want to call it, that you can push me around. I never dream of it. He continued typing, and she knew he would shine her on to do exactly what he wanted, because he was that way. Luckily, she was that way, too, and would push him right back. It made for pretty hot sex, and she knew it was all well-meaning. If she had a man who let her push him around, it would be boring. Max was her equal. That was exciting. I'll speak with Gibson today. I'm sure he'll be at dinner. Speaking of that, my mother called when you were in the shower. She made me promise to tell you tonight will be a full jamboree gathering. What? I haven't even told Renee yet. She headed to the front door, but of course, he got there first. Where are you going? Okay, here's another thing we can't be doing. 
I need to be able to come and go without a list of permissions. I have a thing about that. You know why. Also, back off. I can't tell my sister about all this on the phone. Duh. I need to see her face to face. If she hears from other people, it'll hurt her feelings. Call her first. My father and mother know. Gibson knows. It'll trickle down. Then we can go over there. She closed her eyes, seeking patience. Max, I don't need you to go with me everywhere. He stepped closer, nuzzling her, licking over the bite mark she'd left exposed. I know, but I like to look at you. I like to watch you move and know I've touched every part of your body. I like you and my cat isn't quite ready to not be with you a lot. Oh, your cat. Poor cat. Gets the blame for all your bossy ways. She smiled, knowing he couldn't see her face, but would feel it anyway. Get your keys and let's roll. I'm going over to Renee's now, whether you are or not. Your cat will have to deal. Sorry to get you guys up so early, Kendra said to Jack, who looked adorably rumpled. I need to talk to Renee. You're welcome here anytime, sweetness. He kissed the top of her head and paused a moment. I think I see why you're here. Yeah. Don't let her talk to anyone on the phone until I tell her myself. Apparently, the cats are a gossipy bunch, and there's a hootenanny tonight to celebrate. Max snorted. There should be. Hey, Jack. Got any coffee? Just made a pot. Go on through. Galen should be back shortly. He went for a run. Renee is in the shower. Ren? She called out as she entered the bedroom. Kendra? Renee came out of the bathroom on a puff of steam. Is everything all right? Yes, more than all right. I wanted to tell you myself. But Renee saw the mark and grinned widely. Get out. Yay, I'm so pleased for you both. She hugged Kendra tight. This is so awesome. How awesome is it that you found your Mr. Wright and he also happens to be my Mr. Wright's brother? There's more, Renee grinned. There's always more with the De La Vega men. It looks like I took a cat. I don't know how. We were, well, you know. He bit me and it was, wow, awesome. And all in. Then it just happened. I mean, one moment I'm in his bed all sex exhausted, and the next I'm a freaking jaguar. I felt their magic, the energy of all the cats and their jamboree. My magic is changed. Max says he's never heard of anything like this. Ditto with Cesar and Imogene, but Gibson's on the case, so I'm sure we'll have answers soon. He's one of the most accomplished and together people I've ever met. Anyway, I need to talk to that witch who mated with one of Gabe's wolves. Maybe he can tell me something, give me some insight. Rosemary and Mary might be able to help, too. Renee simply stared at her. God, do you hate me for not telling you right away? Are you mad that I took on a cat? Renee burst out laughing. No, I'm trying not to be petty and not doing a very good job of it, Beth. Both women laughed for some time about that. She's going to flip her lid. If she wasn't pregnant, I could be happier and maybe even taunt her. But now she's bearing the next generation of Jaguar or some stupid shit like that, and I have to pretend she's worthy of something nicer than a kick to the face. Kendra grinned at her sister. She's snotty. But there has to be a reason why. I mean, all the siblings except for her, even Carlos, find a way of at least being civil. Anyway, she sucks on lemons and we don't care. Plus, Max says I rank higher than she does. I love that. I may have to mention how I had no idea of that when she can hear it. You're such a bitch. It's why I love you so much. Renee kissed her forehead. Max is out there? I bet his cat is doing the pee-pee dance to come in here to check on you. The laughter started anew. He can hear everything anyway. The nifty thing is, so can I. Yes, I can. And I'll have you know my cat does not do any such pee-pee dance. Thank you very much, Renee. Max called out from the other room. Come on, let's go out there. I need coffee. Then I need to go back to my place and work a bit. Or my old place. Whatever. They walked out and both of them paused at the sight of Galen, mopping his bare upper body off with his shirt, as he stood laughing and talking with Jack and Max. Ah, damn, I think I just had some really dirty thoughts about your husbands.
Renee nodded. Go on ahead. I have them all the time. Well, you're not involved, though Max is. I promise there's no brother touching in this particular filthy fantasy. Not between them, anyway. They looked up, three sets of wary, sexy, alpha male eyes locked on the two women. Kendra waved. Don't mind us. We're just objectifying you. Max rolled his eyes, but Galen walked toward her. Christ, Max was right. He took her hands. Welcome to our family, Kendra. Max needed someone like you. No, that's not right. He needed you. And this cat of yours. Ah, there she is. Kendra felt it then, the distinctive brush against her insides, that otherness coiled within. Wow, she breathed out. I felt her. My cat. Max was there at her side suddenly, pressing against her. Mmm. He nuzzled again, that spot he'd marked, and it drove her crazy. I can scent her now, stronger than before. It's more than a ghost. Stop that, she murmured. You're stirring me up, and this isn't the place. He laughed, his lips near her ear. I'd apologize, but it'd be a lie. Uh, you're incorrigible. She stepped away from him. Galen, smiling, handed her a mug of coffee. And you stop looking so good. Put a shirt on. Renee pointed toward their bedroom. No need to cover up on my part. Kendra winked at him and Max swatted her ass. The taste of her laughter was still on her lips when everything fell away and a new kind of sight jerked her into another level of consciousness. Numbers, numbers, numbers. They fell from her lips as she scrambled for the table. Pen, paper, now. No one questioned her. The items she needed appeared and she began to write. Call Rosemary, Renee murmured as she read over Kendra's shoulder. Max hoped his brother or Jack planned to do that because he wasn't moving from Kendra's side. Her magic had taken over in a way he'd not seen thus far, and he needed to stick there to be sure she would recover without a problem. When she'd gone into this odd state, his bond with her had changed. He knew she was all right, but the way between them had been flooded with her energy, and it changed his perception. Fascinating, even as he worried, he was certain she was fine. What is it? Jack asked, as Galen picked the phone up and began to dial. It's, looks like streets and maybe a town? Numbers. Jack examined the paper. Looks like coordinates, latitude and longitude. The spell, Kendra said on a gulp of breath, as if she'd surfaced from being underwater. This is where he is. Rosemary and Mary glanced at the paper and agreed. This worked very fast. It usually takes at least several days, Mary spoke, as she studied Kendra intently. And you have a carrier in there, a beast. You took on a cat? Rosemary looked up from the map a Keo had brought over. You've had all sorts of adventures we haven't talked about. Kendra's face fell a bit, and Max glowered at her aunt. I'm sorry. It's not that I've done it on purpose. It's all happened so fast, and you weren't here, and I wanted to talk to you. But you have your own life to live right now. For the first time in forever, you have your own life, and you're not responsible for me. I just wanted you to have that. Let's go for a walk, shall we? Rosemary held her hand out, and Max, though he wanted Kendra to confide in her aunt, it was clear they both needed it, also didn't want her out there without protection. Why don't I accompany you both? Akio bowed deeply. I'll refrain from eavesdropping. He made an X over his heart, and Kendra's smile brightened the room. Jack's gaze moved to Max, checking in with him about that. Max nodded once. We'll need to put together a plan and a team to go out to these coordinates to investigate anyway. You have the time. Good idea. Why don't all us witchy types go to breakfast and fill each other in? Akio can sit with us because, well, come on, look at him. Renee put her arm through his. I can make breakfast here, Galen muttered. Not the same. They need this time, Max said quietly. When they'd all left, Max called Gibson, who quickly put another two guards on the restaurant, and said he'd be right over to discuss the situation regarding Renee and Kendra's father. When they had ordered, Rosemary turned to Kendra. Before we talk about this extraordinary man you've fallen for, I want to talk to you about something you said back at the house— you're part of my life, and you always will be. 
I don't want you to ever feel like I don't want to be involved in your life. You're only my niece and name. In reality, you're my daughter, and so is Renee. I cherish that. Being part of it is not an imposition. It's my pleasure. How do you always know what I need to hear? Kendra asked her aunt. I've told you this from the start, silly woman. But now you can hear it, and for that I'm grateful. I can tell what you need to hear because I know you. Rosemary looked to Renee. I'm only just getting used to having you around again, and it's wonderful to grow together and build a family with me in it. I love you both, and I always have. After some hugs and the arrival of the food, Kendra told Renee, Mary, and Rosemary the whole story of how she'd come to have a cat living inside her. Aside from the fucking parts, that is. She wasn't going to share that with her aunt and Akio, for goodness sake. I just didn't plan it at all. It just happened. He didn't do the change on purpose. In fact, he didn't even break the skin when he bit me. She pulled her shirt away a little bit more to show the mark. Akio's mouth turned up into a smile. Always looks so beautiful, he said before going back to his giant plate of eggs, bacon, sausage, pancakes, breakfast potatoes, and two bagels. Mary jotted down notes as they spoke. I'll see what I can find about this sort of transference. It can't be too common, because we'd have heard of it. But it's not entirely out of the realm of possibility. Perhaps it's because the mix of magics between different types of others is loaded with possibility. It could be that Kendra had been opening herself to him, to his energy, and also other energies and essences as she trained with me. That could have made such a transfer of magics far more powerful than it would be otherwise. It seemed to me that she'd changed when she was at my house on Friday, even. The way she worked her magic had changed. Interesting. I'll speak with Imogene this evening to see if their history has any such stories. Rosemary stirred her coffee. If I may interrupt for a moment, Akio said. The oldest warden female is somewhat of an elder among her people. She may be a good resource as well. Oh, great idea. Yes, I'd love an introduction. Rosemary looked back and forth between Renee and Kendra. I'm sure she'd be a lovely help, and perhaps in the future we can work together. Again, her aunt paused. I've been thinking about moving here permanently. Rosemary sipped her coffee. Kendra's heart lifted. Really? That would be wonderful. But what about your job, your house? Uncle Roger? I miss you, sweetie. She smiled at Kendra and then to Renee. And I want to know you more. I can't do that if I'm on another coast. Your uncle has his own life, his own kids and family, grandchildren now. He's happy in San Jose, so I don't see any reason to disrupt that. But there are airplanes, and he likes the East Coast, so he'll visit. You two are my children, and one day you'll give me grandchildren. My job is a job. I can get another job here. In fact, Mary and I are thinking of expanding her shop, and we wanted to talk to you two about how you'd feel about it. We'd need your help. Kendra smiled. How we'd feel about having you here with us? Duh, we'd love it. I miss you. I do want you to have a life, but I can't deny that I've missed you. And she had. So. Much. The talk she'd had with Max had really cleared things up in her head. Rosemary looked back and forth between Renee and Kendra. We'd like you to help us work with others like us, to train them in other forms of magic, defensive magic. Kendra laughed. Yeah, I want in on that. I was telling Max about this, too. I think it's criminal not to admit we need the help, and we're not prepared for what's coming. He's worried. It's what male shifters do. But he respects my space, respects what I believe in. He'll be behind me on this, though we may have to endure extra guards. I'll do whatever I can, too, Renee added. Part of it will be for you to learn and then teach others. That's a manageable task. We don't have the resources to undertake something huge, so we teach, and those we've taught will teach. The excitement of what her aunt and Mary were speaking of began to build. This could be a way to unite and work with other groups who will be possible targets as well. Why shouldn't witches learn the magics of other paths when it comes to healing and defense? We've erected so many walls, and right now, that's part of why we're such big targets. There are more of us than them, and yet, because we don't interact, the balance shifts away from our favor. I'd 
Love that. Renee leaned in closer. I would love to learn healing magics from other traditions. There's so much out there. Wow, this could be massive. Kendra realized this could be a great way for Renee to continue to gain confidence with her own magic. She'd be an excellent teacher and leader. You'd rock that job, Renee. You have so much you've learned on your own. You created your own form of intuitive healing magic. That's right. I hope those boys of yours are prepared to share you in your spare time. Mary grinned. The shop has plenty of room for you two to participate in all this. Of course. That makes you not only a visible target, but an extremely attractive, visible target. Akio leaned back in the booth. You would be like a buffet to those out to find you and take your energies. Maybe so, but we can't all hide. It's not protecting anyone. They're finding us anyway, and we're weak in our ignorance. They don't hesitate to learn and use whatever energies they can against us. It's insane not to at least work with others who share our goals and philosophies to protect ourselves. I'm not advocating that we go out and use magics that are derived from pain or despair. But we damned well better figure out how to pull ambient energies from the space around us so that we can do it when they make a move against one of us. If not, we're just being victims. I'm not a victim. The corner of his mouth twitched up. Indeed. But I am not your mate. He looked to Renee. Your mate, an alpha werewolf, and your other mate, an alpha cat. Oh, and yours, Kendra, the next in line alpha. What you propose to do will put you in more danger, especially in the beginning. It would be wise to remember that when you speak of this to your men. Rosemary nodded. Their safety is paramount to me as well. I'm moving here to be part of keeping them safe, and many others like them. Mary spoke then. The shop and the house are warded. Both are totally safe. And Kendra is right. Our own silly prejudices have kept us ignorant. We have to do something, or we'll be in far more danger next year and the year after that. Our children will be in danger. Shifters, too. Any of us who are imbued with magical energies. Let me talk to Max about it before anything else gets planned. He'll feel like I'm going around him, and I'd feel the same in his place. He'll resist, big time. But in the end, he'll respect me and support my choice. Renee agreed. Me too. Galen and Jack have been on high alert with all this stuff for months, so I need to approach the subject with caution. They're smart men. They'll hear me out. But I have to do it my way. Good idea. So, is tonight like a wedding ceremony? Rosemary asked. I have no idea. Max just told me it's some all jamboree meeting thingy. I'm sort of reeling. Not that I doubt any of my choices, I don't. But it was totally unexpected. I can't quite believe it, but I'm glad for it. Chapter 11 No! Max stalked into her apartment where she'd only moments before tucked her finished work into her case. She knew he'd be this way, so she just looked up at him. You know... I said we could discuss it more fully when I finished my work. She'd laid out the plans they'd all made over breakfast as he'd driven her to her apartment. She'd only gotten him to agree to table the discussion for the time being so he could think over everything she'd told him. Oh, and that she'd move in with him. Worked out pretty nicely, she'd thought. He got what he wanted. Her aunt could take over Jack's place when Kendra moved in with Max. And she could finish up her prep work for the coming week. Discussion does not equal you storming in here saying no. You're supposed to have mellowed after you thought over things for a few hours. He looked at her, blinking his eyes and probably wondering why she hadn't simply done exactly what he said. It was almost cute the way he just assumed everyone would do his bidding without question. No. Kendra, this is fucking insane and you can't possibly think I'd support it. <laughs> of course I think that. And you will. You know it. Right now you're all, grr, she's unsafe, let me wrap her in cotton and hide her in my sock drawer. It's who you are. But you're also the guy who is a keen lawyer, an intelligent, accomplished man who understands what it means to lead. I have to lead here, Max. She felt him through their link, his agitation, annoyance, his fear for her. But also his pride in her. Damn it. He took her hands, drew her close. Don't do this. 
I can't get behind any plan that puts a big neon target around you, complete with a map. She fought for patience. We all have paths to walk. My mom's path was short and tragic. But it led me here, to you, Max, to what we have. I'm not stupid. I'm not going to be careless. We both know Gibson put more guards at the school anyway, and I'll be living with you in our house, at the side of a 700-pound jaguar encased in a man the size of a redwood tree. I'm safe with you. I'm safe at school, and I'm safe at Mary and my aunt's shop. I need to do this. This is my path. I get that you're worried. I understand it's dangerous. But we both knew I can't not do this. This was what pussy got you. Max knew trouble would come from this little slip of brunette heaven at his side. Let me do this, Max. I need to do this, Max. Damn it all to hell. Yes, he knew. He'd known from the moment she began to talk about the danger witches faced without understanding their full potential. She'd have to do something about it. It was her way. He admired it, even. But how could he sit by and watch her put herself in danger this way? And then, of course, when he'd been about to resist, she'd brought up all that stuff about honor and leadership. He was pissed off that he could do nothing but go along with this stupid plan because she was right and he hated that, too. Fuck the rest of the world. She was his, and she would be in danger even more after this. Perhaps from her own people. So there he stood on his parents' doorstep, utterly beguiled by a woman who was totally insane. Worse, he admired her strength, her fire and independence. She wasn't going to just turn tail and run. She wanted to fight. She noted his annoyance, most likely feeling it via the link, and gave him the side-eye, stupidly, as Cock thought she was even sexier when she was annoyed right back. Stop it. Your parents are going to see how pissy you're being. Geez, we had sex twenty minutes ago. You promised it would cheer you up. Now I'm going to figure out it was just a diversionary tactic and a way to have sex all rolled into one. You're destroying my fantasies about you. He would not let her make him smile, damn it. Don't think you can get out of this by referencing the sex, which you clearly remember exactly how much I enjoyed. She turned, her body brushing against his, those big green eyes wide and sexy. Do you think I'd do that, Max? A man like you could never be distracted by sex. Of course, she used her sexy voice and rocked her hips forward, grinding herself against his cock. Witch, be careful what you go stirring up there. He tried to sound gruff, but she knew as well as he did that she got to him. Or what? Oh, for God's sake, when will one of you start thinking with the right head? Hi, Beth. Lovely to see you. I only have one, so I'll volunteer. Kendra poked her head around Max's body, so he turned to keep himself between them. Thanks so much for coming tonight to celebrate me and Max. I feel very welcomed to the family. But you're early. Is that to celebrate me even more? Max wanted to smile, but he didn't. Beth's sneer was a mar on her otherwise lovely face. Her issues with humans had simply become part of her, like a sickness. They'd all tried over the years to help her, and by that point Max was done. He'd let Kendra deal with most of it, but if Beth got out of line, he'd handle it. He and Galen were united on that point now that the full extent of what she'd done to Renee had come to light. We'll see you inside. Kendra waved before turning back into his arm so they could go inside. Immediately, the sound of family surrounded him, righted his sense of being off balance after his disagreement with Kendra, helped him find a center, and there she was, had been all along. You're the center of everything for me. He kissed her temple. She smiled, bright and full of pleased surprise. What a lovely thing to hear. Thank you, Max. I love you. She tiptoed up, her hand on his chest, her lips brushing against the side of his neck, as she pressed herself to him, hugging him tight. She hadn't come out and said it yet, but it sounded natural from her lips, and he knew it lived there, even before she'd said it. Still, he needed it. I love you, too. Let's do this, she winked. Kendra! Cesar de la Vega came into the living room from the kitchen, clapping his hands before holding them open. 
Kendra hugged his father. You look very snazzy tonight. Thank you, baby. Imogene loves me in the navy pinstripe, and who am I to refuse her when she looks so pretty? Cesar waved to Max's mother, who appeared to be refastening a barrette for one of Max's numerous nieces. She smiled at the sight of them and indicated they come over to her with an imperious tip of her head. Cesar nodded at Max, a father to his son, saying, You did well for yourself. We'll grab your mother and head into the office for a few minutes before the rest arrive. Caesar took Kendra's arm, winking at Max. I'm stealing your woman. I promise to give her back. Later. His father drew Kendra away, her hand tucked in the crook of his arm. He wants to say no, he can't. Cesar laughed at that. Kendra had to grin at how well father knew son. I'm sure he trusts your ability to protect me if it came to that. Still, Max trailed along, right on Kendra's other side. Smart girl. Cesar patted her hand as they reached Imogene, who strolled along with Max, right behind them. I see your father has fallen for your wife. Imogene cocked her head as she looked up at Max. Whole lot of stuff for you in just a few months, eh? True, mommy. All that came before was training for now. They entered his parents' massive home office, closing the door behind them. Here, in the heart of this house, was the Jamboree's power center. Gibson had a full office on the grounds as well, right next to Max's. His father rarely invited his children into the office, instead doling out occasional meetings, there as incentive for good behavior, old school, and very clever. The office of the Jamboree, the job leading it, was bred into him, heart and soul, blood and bone. He'd been raised to honor it, to understand it for the gift and responsibility it was, both to him and to the cats he'd lead someday. Kendra would have no way of knowing this, and yet she gave the space respect the moment they entered. First, we wanted to say welcome to our family. As Max's parents, our son is a good man, a strong cat, and he'll lead this jamboree into the future. That's a tough job one that will oftentimes put him in conflict with his own and with humans. We trust you to have his back, to lead with him and hold this jamboree close. We couldn't ask for more in anyone our children brought into our family. Imogene leaned down and Kendra, eyes downcast, rubbed her cheek along his mother's jawline. See there? Already she's a queen. Cesar took Kendra's hands. Now, as your alphas, we wish to welcome you to our family, to our jamboree as not only our daughter, but as the next alpha here. We have every confidence in your values, your judgment, and your abilities. There will be trouble, I'm sorry to say it, but I believe it. Kendra, you're going to have to underline the point yourself. This is how our culture works. They'll respect you if you can handle yourself. Max told me what to expect. She held her back straighter, as did my sister. What happened to her is inexcusable. She didn't know she had her magic to protect her. I do, and I will. No matter who it is, I will not be threatened. Imogene looked to Max. Her smile was sly. Of course, I'll do my level best to win them over with my sparkling wit. Cesar laughed, kissing her cheek. Of course you will. His father looked to Max. Now that you're married, the jamboree will look to you more and more for leadership. You've done a fine job so far, but at this point, you'll need to be my proxy at the Intra-Jamboree Nation. You'll fill the seat in Imogene's place. Kendra, once you've got a better grasp of our national and international political situation, you will need to accompany Max to these meetings. You will need to choose your own committee assignments. Imogene will begin to instruct you on all this. Kendra nodded. I'm eager to learn. His parents then cracked open some champagne and explained how the evening would progress. He's protective, but you're higher ranked than he is. He knows you're capable of protecting me. Still, he'll find a way to stalk us, just in case. Cesar laughed again, a buoyant, booming sound that drew the eye of many in the room as they sailed through. The house had filled up considerably more in the time they'd been in the Jamboree office. As they'd all exited, he'd told Max he was stealing her again, and would see him later. Max hadn't liked it. Kendra knew he wanted to check in with her to see what she'd felt about what had gone on. But Cesar was the alpha, and he had a plan. You know my boy pretty well. The last time you were here, there had been trouble. You didn't get the tour. Do you trust me, Nina? 
She was one of his cats, she realized. Max hadn't said it that way, but that's what it was. And she realized she did trust him, understood that even the deepest part of her, Cesar de la Vega, would put his cats before himself, always. She was still shaken, excited, touched by the meeting they'd just had. True to his word, he was opening his family to her, readying her to lead. The responsibility was frightening, but at the same time, she was honored that they felt she was worthy of that sort of trust and responsibility. Yes, he squeezed her hand, clearly pleased with her answer. Ah, Mondo, come and meet Kendra, Max's wife. The famous baby de la Vega, Armando, was an artist who traveled all over the world. She knew he and Galen were very close. Rene adored him and had nothing but positives to say about him. Talked to Max on the phone three weeks ago, and he raved about you the whole time. Raved? Max? Well, raved for Max. So more words than his usual one and two-syllable grunts. Armando took her hands and rubbed his face along hers, pausing. Double congratulations are in order, I see. I didn't know you'd taken the change. Welcome to the jamboree. It just sort of happened. We weren't expecting it. Armando's brows rose. Really? Darling, what have you and my brother been doing that the change was a surprise? She laughed, blushing from the tips of her toes upward. No, God, I didn't mean it that way. I just meant he didn't do it the regular way. His bite didn't even break the skin. Really now? Well, I want to hear more of this story. But as I can see, everyone getting impatient that they haven't been formally introduced. I'll let you fill in the rest later. How did you know that I'd taken on a cat? Cesar interrupted then. They'll be able to scent your cat. Lean into Mondo's neck. Take a deep breath. Kendra did so and realized he smelled like Max. Not exactly the same, but elements. The warmth of bark, the scent of leaves, fur. Eh? I see. He smells sort of like Max. May I? She indicated Cesar's neck. He tipped his head a bit, and all speaking around where they stood, stopped immediately. If she asked him what was happening, it would make her look weak. She knew that. He'd given her his neck. A huge honor. She breathed in and realized there were elements of his scent that also mirrored Max, but some were sharper, stronger. Do you scent the difference? He asked when she stood back. I do. Thank you for that. It's my job to teach the newly changed, my job to help you understand us. Your sister opened doors for you, you know that. You and she are so good for my boys. Immy and I know you will lead at Max's side with strength and courage. He said it loud enough that all those straining to hear got an earful. His enthusiastic approval of her as a match for Max, and as an alpha to succeed him and his wife when the time came. Max came down the steps into the backyard, and after embracing Armando, he turned to his father. Gracias, papi. Max hugged his father and then put an arm around Kendra. We need to make the rounds. Introduce you to everyone. He was happy. She felt it humming between them, the heat of it, the warmth of belonging. His father waved a hand at him. That's what I was doing, boy. It's not the first time I've done this. Max dipped his head, but kept his arm around Kendra. The two of them, on the outside, seemed very different. Scratch the surface and they were the same man, just in different packages. The more she got to know Max's family, the more she liked them. Well, she gave Beth the side eye. Most of them, anyway. Of course. Thank you. Imogene came out, making sure everyone saw her head straight to Kendra to embrace her. Max had coached her for part of the afternoon, so she knew to rub her cheek along her mother-in-law's as a sign of obedience and respect. So much was going on, and she had to bite her tongue. She wanted to whisper stuff to Max, but since they all had great hearing, she couldn't risk telling him she thought things were going pretty good. Across the back deck, she caught sight of Renee, Galen, and Jack arriving. Renee had a big bouquet of flowers. Touched, Kendra blew her sister a kiss and mouthed a thank you. It strengthened her, knowing her sister had arrived and had her back safe and way less alone. One by one, she met all seven of Max's siblings. According to the ritual Max had described, his parents would introduce her formally to the family and any other elders or cats of very high rank. 
and then they'd introduce her to the jamboree at large. How much she was accepted and her relative place in a jamboree would be determined by how Cesar and Imogene handled the introductions. The more effusive they were, the better it would be for Kendra. So far, they'd both held her hand and had taken her arm or caressed her shoulder. Renee hadn't gotten this much support when she'd come around with Galen. For a long time, Imogene hadn't liked Renee. But a few years back, the two women had a showdown, and Imogene had announced she'd been wrong about Renee, and was fully supportive of her place with Galen. Kendra was really glad she didn't have to endure that sort of cold shoulder. It was just another example of how amazing her sister was, how strong. She'd won over nearly everyone through years of relentless politics and weary extensions of trust and affection. When they got around to Galen, Kendra gave a big hug to Renee, who beamed at her sister proudly as she stood at Galen's side. Galen gave Max his throat before they embraced. As they turned to head toward Carlos, Kendra paused, cocking her head and listening. There's something wrong. Max spoke before Kendra had figured it out. Gibson streaked past on full alert. He hadn't changed forms yet and still brought the hair on the back of her neck to standing. Rosemary, who'd been in the crowd, rushed forward, but guards blocked her out. Kendra turned. Let her in. No one gets near the alpha couple or the next in line. I'm the next in line too and she's my aunt. Let her through or let me to her. Max was at her back. We need to get you out of here, he said into her ear. No. Anxiety crept into her belly and she realized it was her cat. Her cat wanted to seek shelter and watch. But she knew one of the thieves was nearby. The magic in the air was amateurish. Nothing natural lived in it at all. It was as if its user had bought it in a box like macaroni and cheese. She moved toward her aunt. What's going on? Let her through. They're trying to help. Max called out and the wall of guards let her pass. Renee on her heels. This guy is a joke. Rosemary looked around, shaking her head. That's some D-list magic. Nothing of him at all in it. Even if he could lure any of us out, he's too weak to do anything with us. Gibson shielded Max, who moved him over to shield Kendra. She rolled her eyes at them both. What if he's pretending to be an amateur, to lure you out and then he's all bam, super witch or something? Galen looked from Renee to Rosemary. That was my question, too, though of course I couldn't lend it the poetry you do. Gibson bowed his head to his brother, and Galen scratched his nose with his middle finger, flipping his brother off on the sly. Rosemary thought it over for a moment. No, not unless he was uproariously good. And if he was, he'd be in here. Any witch with that kind of power doesn't need to bother with luring. He'd come in and take. Let's go grab him, Kendra turned to Gibson. Come with me or send another guard. I only need to be there because he might try something on you. I can stop him easily. Then you can grab him and bring him here. And we can take him to the dungeon and beat the truth out of him. Gibson said it with a straight face, but Kendra heard the joking tones. Kendra, in another situation I might agree with you. But what if some of these more skilled witches are using him as bait to get you out there and then they'll strike? I'm not even saying this because you're next in line. You're a courageous cat, beautiful. But there are people in the world who will sink to any level to win. Create any level of pain and destruction to get what they want. If we're going to face that kind of being, we need to be prepared. It is my suggestion that we simply continue with this party, Cesar said. Your Aunt Rosemary has warded the house quite well, so they can't get in. Why let them harass you? Why let them win on such a lovely evening, eh? He held his arm out. Gibson is right. We don't know enough to move just yet. Rosemary nodded and Max heaved an audible sigh of relief when she took his father's arm. Let us continue. We have a new member of the Jamboree to introduce. Imogene stood, the fading light against her skin. She held a hand out and Kendra stepped forward to take it. This is Kendra. Kendra is the other half of Max's heart. I have seen this face. She cradled Kendra's cheeks. In his eyes. She wears his mark and has accepted the space at his side. The gazes in the room sought Kendra. Some were friendly. Some were hostile. All were curious. She has taken on our Max. And a cat. 
The voices in the room rose. He had no right without permission. Beth stood forward, anger slanting wrinkles of fury into her face. He did not seek the counsel to request bringing another cat over. Imogene blithely ignored her daughter to continue speaking. He had no need. Her cat has come to her in an altogether unexpected way. He has marked her. Imogene looked to Kendra, indicating she show the bite, and she did. But the skin has not been broken. Look at her. She was with people until late afternoon yesterday. Others saw her before seven this morning. Even if Max had broken the rules and put her through the change, there is simply no way she would be in any shape to stand, much less be up and ready for breakfast in a restaurant full of people less than sixteen hours after that happened. Even the strongest among us in our history have not had that sort of recovery time. Then how do we know she's even got a cat? It hadn't been Beth that time, but Carlos. He shoved people aside, heading toward her. Part of her knew he'd never be allowed to touch her. Max wouldn't allow it. But she didn't need him. In fact, it was necessary she do a lot of this on her own, or none of them would see her as an equal. Don't touch me. This will be your only warning. Her cat rose. Even as Max made to shove his brother, Kendra dropped away, and her cat growled while the magic filled her. Her voice hadn't been her own. The knowledge of that should have scared her. Yet she found herself fascinated instead. Carlos's eyes widened, and he dropped his head. Imogene growled at her son before speaking to the crowd again. One of these days, a child of mine is going to bring home a spouse, and we will not have all this drama. Carlos, you're being rude, and now you have been warned. Beth, sweetheart, the baby. Take a deep breath and try not to be so angry. I worry about you. And just like that, everyone went about their business, talking, eating, drinking, as if this sort of thing happened all the time. Renee sidled up to her. Yes, it does happen all the time. She must have looked surprised because Renee laughed. I can see the question written all over your face. Well done, by the way. That growl thing was awesome. I don't even think I could do it again if I tried. Max hugged her from behind. You could. Your cat will protect you and yours. You let her do that. You'll find you get along better if you listen to each other. All this is going to take a lot of getting used to. Also, I hate standing here eating meatballs when our target is right out there, and we're not going to get him. Max squeezed harder. No, Gibson is right. It's too dangerous. Be smart about this. She sighed. All right, all right. I deserve some of that cake tempting me from the buffet table, you know, for showing all that restraint. Max stayed glued to her side every moment he could. He was fully agitated with the situation and wanted to take her home, to their home, where she'd be surrounded by four walls and much less a target than she was out in the open in a crowd. His mother kept sweeping Kendra off to meet this or that person, usually with Renee on her other arm. The two sisters filled the room with their own kind of light and energy. He and Galen sort of orbited around their women as the evening went on. Right then, though, he saw something he needed to attend to. Carlos, say word, if you please. He'd worded it like a request, but no one made the mistake of believing it was optional. I know what you're going. No. Max cut him off. You don't. Which is why I'm next in line and you're not. Don't speak. You're not here to speak. You're here to listen. Kendra is my wife. She shares my position and rank, and she's welcome in our world. Whether you like her or not is utterly inconsequential to me. You have a right to like whoever you please. You don't have a right to invade Kendra's space without repercussions. And by that I mean from her. She's not only carrying a cat, she's a powerful witch in her own right. I've seen her use it, and you would be wise to keep your mouth shut and leave her alone if you don't like her. His brother began to speak, but Max held a hand up. I said no. You have been warned by Kendra herself and now by me. Do not do this. If you push her to react, you will shame yourself and the family. She'll shame herself if she can't handle a challenge. I know the rules, Max. Do you? He let his cat show in his eyes, let him glint in the lengthening incisors. I'm warning you. After she's done with you, I'll be right there. Do not attempt to harm what is mine, or I will defend it. 
There can be no mending that rift. I will no longer have you as a brother if you do this. And if I shame her, she's not fit to lead. She's not one of us. She's not human. She's not even fully a witch, because she's taken a cat. What does that make her, and why do you not see it as a threat? Carlos stormed off, and Max rubbed his hands over his face. It had to be said. Galen stood next to Max, his arms crossed over his chest as he watched Carlos leave the deck. He won't listen. Then she'll make him. You know she can. Galen paused. Over time, I've come to believe this behavior in the Jamboree is beyond destructive. You can't have this sort of attitude toward the spouses our cats bring into the Jamboree. Renee handled it, and she's proud. But she shouldn't have had to. Now that I know the extent of what she endured, I have to say, Max, if Carlos calls out a member of this Jamboree's ruling line, he needs to be triumphant or weeded out. Not a single member of this Jamboree should ever doubt that another member has his or her back. This is bigotry backed by bullying. You're the next generation. The change is starting. Don't allow us to backslide. Max realized Galen was right. Gibson had said something similar only a few days before. But he didn't want Kendra to have to deal with this insanity. He wanted to protect her from it, not use her to achieve his ultimate goals. If you want to protect her, yeah, I got it. But she's next in line. If Carlo snips her tail, let her bat him the fuck away. And when that happens, if the circumstances are what he's playing at now, he needs to be excised from this jamboree. This is how I will vote. I want you to know this as my brother, and as the male who will lead us next. And when I vote so, Armando will vote so. I don't know where everyone else will fall, but I know enough to understand there will be a majority. Max looked Galen head on. I admire that bit of politics, Galen. Truly. He did and Max needed to hear it. It meant Galen was officially siding with him in the division Max felt fairly sure would come. And it was Galen's way of saying he'd draw the heat, to share the burden when the time came. He'd have to speak to their father about it, as was his duty, but he'd keep it anonymous. His father would pretend he didn't know who the parties were, but Max would be letting his father know his stand as well. Cesar would attempt to work it out, but Carlos was stubborn. Max doubted he'd back down. Kendra leaned toward Renee as she watched Max and Galen speaking across the yard. That's about me, Renee nodded. Totally, and that digbag Carlos. Carlos, Kendra said it with disdain. That was one de la Vega who fell way far from the tree. Also, nicely done. Digbag is a very worthy insult. I made a mental note in everything. Rosemary narrowed her eyes. Can't abide bullies. Don't you back down the next time he comes at you. You are allowed to hold your ground. If you don't, he'll always see you as prey. Yes, yes, I know they can hear me. Good, they should. Anyone who's even considering threatening you should hear me right now. If he comes at you, you defend yourself and your man. This is your family now. It's your duty. Bigotry is as stupid as it is deadly. Don't you forget that. Renee sipped at her juice. Yeah, Carlos has been leaving me alone, ignoring me and stuff but at least not in my face. We've even gone out on his boat multiple times, and I've left not feeling like I needed to punch someone. Tonight, he seems really agitated. Rosemary is right. They, you, aren't human. I'm not totally human. Don't forget the rules that have governed shifters, like most others, have been geared toward protecting them against the threats of the outside world, namely humans. You have to speak in language he's going to understand. I tried being nice, it worked on most of the jamboree, but on others, I had to find a way to push back when I had less power, dramatically less power. But if I had let them push me around, they'd never have accepted me. You have to kick some ass if he brings it to you, wind his damned clock. Touched and speechless, Kendra simply hugged her sister and her aunt. Thank you both for being here for me, I don't know what I'd do without you. Good thing you'll never have to know, Renee winked. Beth walked by, sneering, and Kendra sighed. Maybe it's because she's not getting it all regular and stuff. How do you explain the rest of her life, then? No, she's just bitter, sour, and not even in a good way like lemonhead candy. Laughing, Kendra looked to her sister. You're on a roll tonight. 
Well, I happen to get it quite regular. She huffed on her nails, buffing them on the front of her shirt. I'm starving. Meatballs were awesome. Cake was awesome. Now I need some of those chicken skewer things. This is all standing up food, right? No sit-down dinner thing? Kendra headed toward the huge buffet table. Beth materialized at her side, and Kendra did her best to ignore her. Of course, Beth wasn't satisfied with that. You might want to have some vegetables. Max has never gone out with a fat woman before. You're like herpes. You keep coming back. Beth, please don't take this the wrong way, but you're a bitch. Excuse me while I take my fat ass to grab another chicken skewer. I'll think of you while I'm eating it. Also, Max isn't dating me. I'm your new sister. Please try to contain your excitement. Beth grabbed her arm, digging her fingers into the skin. The crowd who'd been talking and laughing grew silent. I'd knock you back into the fence if you weren't pregnant. Do you care nothing for the child you're carrying? What kind of crazy, vicious creature are you? Kendra pried Beth's fingers back, harder than she had to. But breaking a finger wouldn't hurt the baby, just Beth. Let go. No. She bent Beth's wrist back until she winced. Now, how about you leave me alone instead, hmm? You don't like me. I get it. It used to be that I was human, but as I'm not, it has to be something else. And at this point, I don't care what it is. I'm not playing these stupid games with any of you. She looked around and gave Max the, if you stop me, I will make your life hell face. As it happens, I find this all totally ridiculous and boring. You think you're special because you don't like me? Pfft. Bitch, please, get your ass in line. Lots of people don't like me. All this puffery and proving myself to a bunch of people who have no intention of liking me anyway is just dumb, and I don't play. She moved quickly when Beth tried to cuff the side of her head. Kendra leaned in close. You have no honor to act this way and endanger your pregnancy. You shame your family. Take your meds or start a blog like everyone else. But don't think the baby you're carrying will protect you if you try to hit me again. She pushed Beth away and turned to Max. I'm out of here. Imogene smoothly approached and hooked her arm through Kendra's. Walk with me, Kendra, please. She barely held back her annoyed sigh. I know this is difficult. It's a time of transition for the jamboree, from old ways to new. Imogene kept her voice down as they moved away from the crowd and into the house. Have I shown you my sitting room? As if she'd agreed, Imogene led Kendra up the stairs and down a long hall lined with photographs. Some of these pictures are Renee's work. Kendra paused to look at a shot taken of Cesar and Imogene as they leaned their heads close with eyes only for the other. It was staggeringly intimate. Your sister has great talent for seeing inside people. Imogene closed the door and indicated Kendra sit on the couch. She does. I don't want to be rude. I appreciate the welcome you've given me, but I'm not going to take it from Beth like you're going to ask me to. That's not going to happen, ever. I'm no one's convenient whipping boy. In the future... I won't be at these mixed events for the entertainment of people who should stop gawking and get some manners, your children included. You can't ask me to prove myself and defend myself and whatever and then add, but not when it's my daughter who's been acting like a monster. Imogene paused. It took your sister a few years to get up the nerve to say all this to me. She shrugged. She's nicer than I am. She wanted to be loved and accepted for the wonderful person she is. She loves Galen a great deal, and wanted to prove herself to his family the same way any other spouse brought into this family has to. Kendra leaned back, crossing her legs. And you don't think you should have to? I really like you, Imogene. I respect you and I love your son. But I'm going to be blunt here, because I think it's what I owe you. As a matter of fact, I don't. I don't think anyone should have to be treated like crap, so your daughter and her bigoted little crew can feel better about themselves. I think further isolation and the silly notion that no one is as good as a cat is just absurd. I'm sure if you applied black or male or something like that, people wouldn't tolerate it, and it shouldn't be tolerated. I'm all for accepting that you are not human and therefore different rules apply. I understand keeping things in the family to avoid unwanted negative attention. By the way, 
from humans who are essentially preaching the same thing your daughter is. You simply lose credibility when you act the way those who seek to harm you act. The irony of that does not escape me, Imogene sat back with a sigh. I accept what Max is, what I am. I'm eager to learn about this entirely new culture. I'm eager to meet the rest of the family and to be part of it. But I'm not going to endure this totally outrageous acting out by your children, simply because that's always how it's been done. It's stupid. I'm not doing it. I did lots of things for a long time to keep from rocking the boat. I won't again. Beth is a problem. She is undisciplined and abusive. Carlos's outburst this evening, right after a possible threat to the jamboree, was intolerable and put everyone, especially the children here, at risk. Imogene's features, which had been inscrutable, relaxed. And so, what do you think should be done? You're their mother. Handle it. Spank them. Kick their asses. Put them on a time out. I don't care. More than their mother, you're their alpha. All this acting out has become normal, and in my opinion, that's not helpful or conducive to a strong jamboree. Are witches so free of drama, then? Kendra laughed. God, no. Suspicious, bitchy, covetous, fearful. But that doesn't erase the danger I felt tonight. I've been feeling. The danger that almost got my sister killed. That killed my mother. I will not end up dead and forgotten like that. Not without a fight. I aim to drag my brothers and sisters out of the dark ages and into the present. I have a battle on my hands, and I really can't say I plan to play silly dominance games with anyone. Imogene's face brightened as she smiled widely. Oh, he did such a good job with you. She patted Kendra's knee. You're going to lead my jamboree into the present, too, aren't you? Ah, that was the reason for this little chat. It had been to test her and her resolve to lead the jamboree with Max. Not without your help and support. Do I have that? Beth is my child, as is Carlos. I don't love them any less than my other children. That's none of my concern, she shrugged. And that's not what I asked. You missed your calling. Should have been a lawyer like Max, Imogene said with a laugh. No, thanks. I'd rather have my classroom with twenty third graders any day. Cesar and I are behind you and Max. We meant what we said earlier. Yes, the cats like Beth need to feel listened to. But they don't have to be tolerated when they cross lines. So why do you do it? She's carrying my grandson. She's my baby. Even when she's an ill-tempered brat who passed her childhood long ago. But I'll deal with her if you'll allow me. Carlos, she sighed. Well, he's another story. I'd thought he'd calmed down. He seemed to be tolerating Renee, even being civil and respectful. Tonight was disturbing. I'm afraid you're going to have to knock him on his hard head to get him to listen. Cesar will speak with him about it. It's not up to me to allow you to do anything. You're this jamboree's alpha. You don't need permission. And you're next in line. One day soon I will hand my family over to you and Max. If I can't trust you, if I can't speak to you, I wouldn't do that. I can't speak for Max. I don't think it's appropriate to be involved in any disciplinary issues with his cats. There are things he has to take care of, and I respect that. I just don't plan to be coming to any events where I have to deal with all this drama. Max is certainly free to do it. It's his family. But I bent once. So far, I lost my way back to myself. And I did it for a man. I let his family take everything from me. I vowed to never go there again. I love Max, and I'd die for him. But I'm not giving him my life, if you understand the distinction I'm not making very clear. Imogene looked at her for some time without speaking until she nodded. You're making yourself very clear. I respect what you're saying. I do hope you give us all another chance and stay for the rest of the evening especially as it's supposed to be about you. I think the point has been made, or I hope it has. I really enjoy having you around. My kids, but two of them, certainly seem to like you. You're good for Max. You help him see beyond his job, his duty. You help him understand duty applies to his whole life, not just his role as next in line. Kendra smiled. All right, thank you. 
he's good for me too. We've got a lot more getting to know each other to go, but he's worth it. He makes me happy. They stood and walked out together to where Max paced in the family room, even as he looked down at the video game the kids played on a nearby television and gave his input. Max had been waiting, not so very patiently, but he'd managed not to storm in and demand to know what was happening. While he'd waited, Gibson had come in to let him know they'd swept outside, only to find no one there, but fresh tire tracks at the top of a nearby rise where there was a nice view of the De La Vega house set back from the street. Gibson had taken Jack with him. The wolf's expertise and input on this was very much appreciated. Max could see Kendra and his mother had reached some sort of amicable accord. The panicked knot in his belly eased slightly. Your lovely Kendra has agreed to give us another chance. Imogene kissed her son's cheeks. You chose well. He smiled at his mother. I agree. Kendra, have you met this motley band of monkeys yet? Max turned and motioned at the room full of kids. Not yet. She moved into the room. Oh, Mario Kart. I love Mario Kart. You want to play? One of the older boys handed a controller her way. Yeah. Chapter 12 The drive back to his house, no, their house, was quiet. She and his mother had laid down some sort of law between them in their little conference, but neither had given him any details. After Kendra had so very powerfully owned her new role and told Beth off, she'd left with his mother. Max had then told Beth and her husband to leave. Cesar did not contradict this, though Max did see his father on a long walk with Carlos later. I'm sorry, he said as they pulled into the drive, waiting for the garage door to open. For what? As she eased to face him, the slap of heat that lived between them stole his breath. Christ, you turn me upside down. A smile touched her lips. You're apologizing because I turn you upside down? He pulled in and shut the engine off. The hem of her dress had slid up, exposing the top of her thigh and the flash of bare skin above the hose she wore. I'm sorry for that fucked up scene tonight. She made her little pfft noise at him. There's a new sheriff in town and they don't like it. Lucky for me, I don't give a rat's ass what Beth or Carlos think. I'm not going back to any such events. You need to know that. I told your mother as well. Baby, that's not going to happen. If anyone gets uninvited to jamboree events for behavior issues, it's not you. She climbed into a seat, straddling his lap. Max, I'm a big girl. I can handle myself. She ground her pussy over his cock. There was no room to move the seat back. He had it back all the way. And he needed inside her body right then. Fuck me, Max. It's been about six hours and I need you so badly my hands are shaking. My cat is quite slutty, apparently. He laughed, as shaky as she was. Slutty works for me. He touched every part of her he could reach. But it wasn't enough. Out. We need out. She growled, but let him open the door and stumbled out. That's when he pivoted her to face the car. Hands on the hood. For now. Feet wide. He pulled her dress hem up, humming at how sexy the stockings looked, loving the rich blue of her barely there panties, which he quickly got rid of. Leaning in, he took a deep breath, all of her entering his consciousness and driving him wild. Hurry, she whispered. When handed, he got his pants unzipped and freed his cock, a bit more adjusting and a quick slide of his fingers through her pussy to be sure she was ready, and he'd positioned himself at her gate and began pushing inside. Her heels were high, high enough that she was at the perfect height. She pushed back against him, meeting him thrust for thrust. Her hair fell from the pretty updo she had it in, making her look disheveled and ridiculously sexy. His mouth watered, just looking at her, looking at their reflection in the windshield. Unable not to, he ripped the back of the bodice open, bearing the pale skin of her back. She arched on a ragged cry of his name. When he leaned down, he meant to lick and kiss, but when his teeth found her skin so warm and pliant, there was nothing else to do but bite. She gasped as her inner muscles gripped his cock. The taste of her skin was unlike anything else. Magnificent salt and spice, uniquely hers, and in turn, 
uniquely his. He let it lie on his tongue like fine wine. She was close. He felt the change in her body. She slickened, heated to the point where he had to clench his jaw to hold back. He pulled out, ignoring her growl of frustration as he sat her ass on his hood, went to his knees, and, spreading her thighs open, dove in, licking her pussy, delighting in her squeal of pleasure. Her nails dug into his shoulders, urging him closer. He found her clit, sucking it into his mouth, pushing her over the edge. He growled his pleasure, always unable to get enough of her, needing more and more, even as he had her. When he found his way back inside her pussy, she opened her eyes, her hair a sexy mess around her beautiful face. He leaned down, fucking into her body so hard, she bounced until she wrapped her legs around him for purchase. His lips found hers and she opened to him on a sigh, her arms twining around his neck. Her taste mixed with his, until it was all just them. She broke the kiss as he continued to fuck her, brushing her lips down his neck until he shouted, coming harder than he could ever remember coming, when her teeth sank into the skin exposed at the collar of his sweater. She struggled for breath, the hard, cold hood against her back, a feverishly hot jaguar shifter at her front, his weight against her, his cock still inside her pussy. Wow, she licked her lips, hoping the feeling would come back. I'm going to have to keep you around just for that part. Wordless, he kissed her chest, over her heart, and picked her up. He always held her with such gentleness and care, that it brought something out she'd known she was missing, but had been unable to quantify. He cherished her. Thank you, she murmured, as she stayed wrapped around him like a monkey. I just fucked you in the garage on the hood of my car and ripped your dress. Amused, he snorted. What are you thanking me for? For loving me? He put her down carefully, kissing her soundly, like I could do anything else. She headed to the bedroom, her dress falling down around her waist. The place he'd bitten stung a little bit, but in the right sort of way. It felt like a secret. Good thing I brought clothes over here, huh? Not that you need them for bed. He leered at her, and she held her hands out, warding him off. Dude, even you can't possibly want to have sex again yet. There's no yet. It's always... She tossed the ruined dress on the counter and bent to turn the shower on. I think I should invest in some of those tearaway dancing clothes with you around. Your murder on my budget. He kissed her back, where he'd marked her, sending delicious tingles through her body. I'll make it an item in our household budget. Clothes for Kendra. That way I can rip all I want. That's part of the fun. Chuckling, he strolled from the room like the hot shit he was. She laughed but it snarled in her throat. Her knees buckled as the first magical hit slammed into her. On the way down, her head smacked the side of the tub, making her see stars as she scrambled to stand. The world slowed as Max's cat bounded into the room. He roared so loud it reverberated off the tile, deafening her for long moments. Using him as balance to stand, she got her legs back and began to focus on whatever it was. In the background, she heard other roars, grunts, and growls. The guards outside, she wagered. Pushing all that back, leaning into the giant cat who'd placed himself between her and the outside, she opened her other sight and found more than she'd imagined. Sharper, more brilliant, and far-reaching. Her magic had amped up considerably as she looked for the source of the magical punch. It pressed against her, this other magic, unhealthy, not organic, so it was more magic than magical, like a chemical instead of a sunset. But it was powerful and dripping with menace. Not my family, not my house, motherfucker, she mumbled, as her hands took flight, fending off, warding, and at the very end, as it faded back, tagging it with a little magic of her own, she slumped, holding her head, her nose now bleeding, or maybe it had been all along. She couldn't be sure at that point. Max shifted back, his face hard and angry, the scent of his cat still in the air. What the fuck was that? Why do you bleed so damned much? I need to kill him for making you bleed. She ignored his anger, knew it wasn't at her. I don't know what it was. 
an attack of some kind. The wards here held him back, but he got through enough to physically slap at me. The nosebleed happens when I use a lot of magical energy really fast, without giving myself the time to spool it up correctly. I also might have hit it when I smacked my head on the tub. You'll feel better in a minute. Your system will heal very quickly now. He crouched at her feet. You scared the shit out of me. I felt it so intensely that my cat came without my bidding. That's not happened in a very long time. Pounding feet ran up the stairs as the guards shouted his name. Hold! He slammed the bathroom door shut. Do you need to go to the hospital? She stood, still shaky, but her vision was clear again, and her nose had stopped bleeding. No, I need a shower and then I need to go outside, nearer the edge of the wards, so I can see if there's anything else out there. He blinked at her, opening and closing his mouth like a guppy. Go on, the guards are worried. You're not going anywhere, Kendra. Wait for me. I'll be back, and you can shower while I'm here to be sure you're not going to fall. She waited for him to leave and turn on the shower. Kendra, damn it! He shouted from the other side of the door. She snorted a laugh as she stepped under the spray. Within moments, he was back in the bathroom. Didn't I tell you to wait for me? You did. I needed to shower. I can do that without an escort. I make a lot of allowances for you in this alpha thing. I'll take my own showers, thank you very much. You're just being contrary for the hell of it. That's so? Don't know why I bother thinking at all, since you're so happy to do it for me. Like I'm dumb. Now you're twisting it. Yep, that's me. Twisting my own damned feelings because God knows when the great Max de la Vega speaks, he knows everyone's heart and mind better than they do. Don't know why I even bother breathing when you should do it for me. He stepped into the shower stall with her, groaning when the spray hit his body. You're bitchy when you're pissed off and scared. Keep that in mind, then. She smirked as she turned to watch him, water sluicing down all that muscle. I think my father tried to warn me about this, he muttered, a smile on his lips as he tipped his head back. She got out and began to towel off. Don't even think about going outside. Guards are on the door. You know what, Max? Fuck you. I told you how I feel about being held someplace I don't want to be. Also, not to sound 14 or anything, but it seems to have escaped your notice that you are not the boss of me. She stormed out of the room, searching through her things to find a pair of underpants and a bra. Shit, he'd fucked that one up badly. He got out, toweling off quickly, and heading out into the bedroom where she stood, strong and feminine. Everything he ever imagined needing and more. Tough, bitchy, protective, compassionate, intelligent, and strong. She had no plans, clearly, to take any guff from him. She'd been balancing on one foot to get her panties on when he barreled into her, taking her to the bed so she ended up on top. I'm sorry about that last part. He looked into her face, genuinely concerned about pushing any buttons her in-laws and ex had put inside her. I know you are, butthead. She leaned down and nipped his lip. His neck tingled where she'd bitten him. He'd nearly forgotten that part. Smiling, he brushed his fingertips over it. Never had one of these before. I like it. You're just trying to flatter your way out of trouble. I'm still going outside. She kissed him and tried to get up. He held her tighter, but she pinched his side, and he yelped, and she made her escape. Next time, it'll be your cock if you try to confine me. Pausing, she sent him a raised brow. Well, outside sex, anyway. He groaned as she pulled jeans on and a sweater over her head. You're going to kill me. Get over yourself. I'm perfectly capable of going outside and looking around. We have to, Max. It's imperative. She walked out in the guards, he planned to kill them all later, got out of her way at the sight of the look on her face. Gibson, let's talk about the plan to go visit my father and his wife when I come back inside, okay? Gibson looked back at Max, who heaved a put-upon sigh and threw his hands up. Wait, at least let me come out there with you. I need pants, or the neighbors will complain. The corner of her mouth lifted. Don't be too sure. If I lived next door... I wouldn't complain at all. He put his jeans on, not bothering with shoes as he grabbed a sweatshirt off the banister and followed her down to the front hall. Are you sure this is safe? 
Why not wait a little while? The longer he's gone, the colder his trail goes. You should understand that very well. And with that, she threw the door open and walked out. Gibson growled, annoyed, leaping in front of her. Listen here, pretty britches. I'm the guard. I go first. You wait for my signal to go ahead. She smiled, lowering her gaze in apology. Of course. I'm sorry, Gib. Show me by not using Gib as a nickname. Gibson snorted, and her laughter lifted Max's heart. What I need to do is walk the perimeter. I won't leave the protection of the wards. I promise, she added to Max over her shoulder. Give me space. All this testosterone and cat energy is like white noise. Gibson sent her a dark look, but backed off. Max recognized the hand signals his brother sent to the other guards, placing them around the yard strategically. Max also knew there were others on the roof with sniper rifles, if Claw and Fang didn't do the job. And yet, the fear clawed at his insides, fear for her. It was an emotion he'd not experienced much, especially as an adult. He wasn't worried about himself, but she was his to protect. Having her out there under threat brought a cold sweat to his spine. He was not used to being questioned. He knew it, and she called him on it. Still didn't mean he had to like it. I can feel your cranky mood through our bond, she said quietly as she walked past. Gibson made no outward appearance of having heard that comment, but for a slight tick of his left eye. All for you, Garida. She flipped him off before stopping near the high hedges of the southern side of the yard, going still, quiet. Her eyes, her cat's eyes, lived in her then, and a wave of admiration and love washed over him at the sight. His woman, strong and brave. Damn it, she was something else. Agitating, yes, but he didn't want anyone else. She was the works, and he'd take the good and the scary, because it was all her. He moved closer, but still gave her space. She cocked her head, breathing in deep, her gaze slowly raking over whatever the hell she saw when she used her other sight. Just as suddenly as she stopped, she turned and headed back into the house. That fucking bastard, she grumbled, as she rifled through Max's front entry table to find paper and a pen. Is that my new nickname, then? Max paused, taking her hand and kissing it. She snorted. Only in my head. Don't you have paper and writing implements somewhere? He pulled another drawer open to expose a neat stack of paper and several pens. Thank you. She began to write all her impressions down as the men waited patiently. Or they may not have been patient, but outwardly, they held a calm menace. You want to fill me in on what you found out there? Max asked her after several minutes. It's the same person, the same one who attacked that night. She paused and smiled up at him. The night you took me to dinner. His eyes warmed for a moment. The beginning of this. He brushed his lips against hers, and her agitation settled slightly. So it's the same person or group. And to be honest with you, I think that weak attempt tonight was a feint. Yes, yes, I was wrong to want to check it out at first. You're right. He grinned, and she rolled her eyes. I'm always right. If you'd accept that, you'd be so much happier. If you're finished gloating, do you remember when we went over to my father and Susan's place? After they ran off? Gibson had organized that, and he nodded slowly. The signature, energy, whatever I felt tonight is similar to what I felt there. He's involved somehow. Or she is. They both are. Whatever. He's part of it. And we need to find him and deal. I sent out an advanced team right before the party at my parents' house. Big fun, huh? Bet you can't wait for more of that. Gibson's smooth, calm delivery only made Kendra laugh harder. Max wore a sour expression. Stop it. You're going to make her more hesitant to go back. Kendra and Gibson ignored Max and went back to their conversation. Gibson indicated the coordinates she'd given earlier. I had to send out some sweepers first, to keep watch and stake out the area before I could send in a team. They're not that far from here, just off 93. Somewhere outside Wilmington. Why didn't you say? Let's go. Kendra made to grab her bag. Gibson said nothing, but kept his arms crossed over his chest. He took a deep breath before speaking again. Kendra, I would not send you out in a first wave. 
My people know how to run an operation, and that's what we'll do. We'll get all the information and reconnaissance to me and Jack, and I will make a plan of attack. We don't involve you until we have a lot more information, and that's not now. I hate to break it to you and all, but I'm more prepared for them than you and your people are. They aren't a physical threat. They're a magical one. You can't fight that. I can. Also, what if they move? That would indeed be unfortunate. And yet it doesn't change the fact that I make those choices when it comes to the safety of the leadership of this jamboree. She looked heavenward, seeking patience. Fine. Do let me know when I'm allowed to act, then. Before she said anything else, she spun and headed upstairs. Back in their room, she dug through her bag until she found her phone and called Rosemary. All this could be over if we just shot that fucker in the head once and for all, and his bitch of a wife. Gibson leaned against the door and gave his brother a look. I don't think so. I mean, at least not right away. We talk to them first. Find out what the hell is going on. What happened with Kendra and Renee's mother. They need the closure and we need the intel. After that, well, accidents happen and you're free to be sure they do. Max punched the speed dial for Galen and filled him in. Galen informed him that Rosemary had shown up moments before and was on a call with Renee and Kendra. They'd keep Renee inside as much as they could, which wasn't much, given that the following day was a Monday and Renee would want to go to work. Gibson interjected with information as they spoke, beginning to build a plan. Jack added his points, telling them he had his people on it as well. Busy girl, your wife. Gibson's mouth might have shaped into a smile very briefly as Max hung up with an annoyed snarl. She's not going to let this go, and I can't blame her. As much as I want to, I can't. This is about her, about her people, and she has every right to want to deal with it. Her mother needs avenging. Gibson lifted one shoulder. Max, it's not going to stop there, and you know it. She has a vision for the future of witches, one you and I both realize is totally unnecessary. This attack thing isn't isolated. Even when we find and eradicate this threat, there'll be more. She has a path, like you have a path, and those will intersect. For instance, when you both drag the jamboree into the 21st century, she'll draw fire, but hold you to the course. We all need it. She couldn't just be a school teacher. No, she has to be Buffy the fucking witch slayer or whatever. Gibson did laugh at that. You'd be so bored with a woman who wasn't your equal in the ambition department. But you're both going to fight a lot. She's headstrong. You are too. You're used to total obedience and having everyone simply turn to you for direction. She's not the type to ask permission. It'll make the sex hotter, though. I'd draw the line at discussing my sex life with you. Must be smoking hot, then. Gibson stood straight. She won't agree to a driver to work. But if you were smart, you'd take her yourself. It would be a lot easier if she just obeyed me. Dream on, asshole. Gibson opened the front door. Gonna be difficult to protect her fully at work. All those kids around. Adults are extra watchful of strange men. I know. But she won't take any time off. I've asked. Do what you can. Always do. Night. With a last wave, Gibson walked out the door leaving Max alone and agitated in his front hallway. Chapter 13 You're going to kick my ass. Kendra looked up, halfway into a smile for her brother-in-law when he said that. Gibson de la Vega, what have you done? He'd been there, just outside the school, waiting at the driver's side door of his SUV. Where Max had the sleek Jaguar... Gibson had opted for a menacing-looking dark SUV with smoked windows. It suited him. He opened the passenger door and she hopped in. She didn't feel like arguing over taking the tea back home, so if they wanted to run out and drive her all over town, so be it. She should make them go shoe shopping or something. The place was deserted. Your father's place. She growled and he huffed an amused snort. Christ. You two are exactly alike. It doesn't matter if your father was there last night when you decided to run off and stand in the crosshairs. We don't know enough to do anything just yet. Kendra, believe me when I tell you that I want to deliver the justice you so deserve. The justice for what he did to you and Renee. 
what he did to your mother. But we need to be smart. Gathering intelligence is smart. I want to know what we're walking into. How many people are there? If they're armed, even if I don't have magic like you do, I have other skills. You and me, sweet cheeks, we need to work together on this. She frowned, hating that he was right. You suck. Who am I just like? He made a sort of hissing sound. Max, did you just hiss at me? Cats hiss when they're annoyed. You're going to end up with a woman who is an even bigger pain in the ass than I am. I can't wait, she giggled. According to my brothers, pain in the ass women are the best kind. He gave her side eye. I'm not convinced of that just yet. Ha, uh -huh. so what's the next step then? I'm taking you to Max. He drove on, silent and menacing, even though no one could see it but her. Are you always so chatty? His gruff demeanor eased for a small moment. Amusement danced in his eyes. Don't tell anyone. They won't believe you anyway. Here's my contribution to the whole working together process. I spoke with the witch who mated with one of Gabe's wolves in Portland. He was very nice, open, but he did not take on a wolf. He said his magical energy improved his focus. I proposed he come out here and learn from Mary and my aunt so he could teach the witches in his neck of the woods. He's thinking about it, going to speak with his wife. He's hesitant. We've all been taught so much fear of learning any other forms of magic. I told him to think it over, not like I'm going anywhere. It vexed her. They had all these rules to protect them. She got that part. But when it turned around on them and made them more vulnerable, she wanted to scream. Energy was energy. It would be used for good or ill. It wasn't like she was teaching anyone how to kill the subject to steal their essence. But if those from other traditions could offer some insight and new skills, why not use that? Why not use that to teach those witches their tradition, too? She knew some of the loosely created covens would feel threatened at the potential loss of individual power bases, but she'd cross that bridge when she got there. Anyway, if she brought it up, Max would flip his lid and start on her about the danger of this, that, and the other thing. All right, thank you. You guys are as complicated as the shifters are, you know that? And apparently as murderous. Meh. Several things. First, what's next with the plan to get my father? Second, I'd rather meet Max at home. I don't want to go to Max's building. Beth is there. I don't have the strength to deal with her. Who does, baby? Who does? Ignoring her won't make her disappear, though. I know that. But it saves my blood pressure, and short of killing her, it's the best I can do right now. She's pregnant. I'm not going to do anything that would endanger the baby. Shall I share something with you about my sister? He pulled into his very own spot in the lot beneath Max's building, totally not listening to her. Something else he had in common with his brother, but she wanted to hear the details about Beth, so she let it go. For the moment. Beth was really into school, popular, pretty, had lots of boyfriends. She was a cheerleader, on the debate team, all that jazz. In her senior year, she was assaulted after a party. Or I should say someone attempted to assault her and she fought back. She's no one's victim, my sister. But she's the one who got in trouble because by then, people knew about shifters. But like now, they didn't trust us. The boy made it out like she'd seduced him and then flipped out. She lost everything. All her friends, or human ones anyway. She was expelled and my parents sued. Eventually, they let her back for the end of the year in graduation, and they publicly apologized. But she was never the same. Nope. Even as he spoke to her, he never took his attention from the immediate area. He was a serious multitasker. I'm telling you this, not because it excuses what Beth is now, but because it sheds some light on it. You're that way. You want to know. And since it's just you and me here, I think you might understand what it feels like to have everything you counted on taken from you in an unfair way. You rose above that. You triumphed. And you found something amazing with Max. She's never shaken it all the way off. And the way our jamboree acts, or has in the past, only made it worse by being so insular. What could she say to that? It wasn't that it made everything all right or acceptable at all. But it helped her understand, and maybe she could approach it differently. Maybe. What's Carlos's story? Him? 
He's just an asshole. Third-born son in a world where oldest counts most. That barely perceptible shrug again. Doesn't seem to have held any of the rest of us back. But Carlos's biggest issue, in my opinion, is that he's not Galen, much less Max. She chewed her lip as she thought it all through, or attempted to anyway. I don't know if it's okay for me to ask you something. I don't know the rules. He paused. I am the bringer. Do you know what that is? A cop of sorts? Something like that. I am the bringer of justice. I am the bringer of law and stability. You are next in line. But you are also someone I know I can trust. Tell me and I will let you know if you're on the right track. Can I say, before you close up again and stop talking in more than one syllable, that this is the most you've said since I met you and I really appreciate it? She knew he would be uncomfortable with the praise, so she quickly moved on. Can you watch, Carlos? Max loves you all so much. I think perhaps he might be blind to someone close to him who might wish to harm him for whatever reason. Carlos bothered her a lot. Beth, well, Beth was just a spoiled bitch, but Carlos had the light in his eyes, that sort of fervent hate that rarely avoided ending up with violence and pain. She didn't trust him at all. It is absolutely acceptable for you to bring any and all concerns for the security of anyone in the Jamboree to me. It's your job, and mine. And to answer your question, yes, I have been and I continue to. I also have issued a rule to my guards to not admit Carlos to your home if Max is not present. Her heart slammed against her ribcage. He'd warned her for her own safety, had chosen her over his brother. She knew he'd be uncomfortable with any sort of overt emotion, so she nodded and grabbed her bag. Thank you. Nausea writhed through her belly for long moments. If Carlos attempted to harm or betray him in any way, it would break Max's heart. Wait. Gibson got out and walked around, exactly like that brother of his. He opened her door and escorted her through the walkway and into the lobby. Yes, yes, it's old school and all, but I'm a gentleman, and by getting out first, I can survey the immediate area and block you as we move into the building. He put a hand on her lower back, but kept his gun hand free as they moved. By the way, Max and I would appreciate it if you'd consider going to the range to learn how to shoot. It's an important skill. So Max knew then? About Carlos? Or was this about Carlos? Gah. In any case, he'd phrased it as a request rather than an order. She could get on board with that. All right, yes. That sounds like a good idea. As long as it's after school or on a weekend, I'm in. Renee waved the two of them over to her small coffee-slash-smoothie bar, located in the sun-flooded lobby. Gibson, try this. She shoved a tall glass his way. Suspicious, he sniffed and then drank some of the liquid. He purred. Renee clapped, beaming. You like it. Yay. He ducked his head a moment. Yes, it's quite good. Thank you. Don't let this get out or anything. Renee looked from side to side and leaned toward Gibson. But Kendra and I are the awesomest sisters ever. Stick with us and you'll have ginger orange juice iced green tea any time you want. She gave him a quick peck on the cheek and he smiled, sweeter than Kendra had ever seen. Gibson shook his head. But the smile remained a little longer before his normal, inscrutable, scary guy face came back. Kendra hugged her sister. I want to talk to you, but I expect Max is waiting. So, how about you, Jack, and Galen go to dinner with us? You too, Gibson. Max took me to this place, dark oak paneling, sumptuous banquets, and the best steak I've ever eaten. It was our first official date. He took you to a moor. He knew it even then. Gibson tipped his cup. This is delicious. Thank you, Peaches. Renee blushed. Bring a date, Gibson. You're good for the digestion and all, on account of you being so handsome. Renee and I can sneak off to the bathroom and objectify you guys. He sighed heavily, but she knew he smiled as he pretended to totally focus on his drink. Before Kendra could take three steps toward the elevator, Max exited, stealing her breath, looking masculine and very handsome in a perfectly tailored three-piece suit. She sidled up to him, forgetting everyone else but Max. My goodness, sir. You're the very model of masculine beauty. She fluttered her lashes, and he dipped down to kiss her quickly. 
You're one to talk. You know what that schoolteacher thing does for me. She wanted to laugh. She wore blue pants, ballet flats, and a deep crimson sweater. Hardly prim, though certainly not sexy. Her hair was loose, and she wore a scarf to hide the bite mark he'd given her. He untied it slowly, revealing the spot where he'd first sunk his teeth into her skin. Her breath came short as she wanted that again. Ah, 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 Carrie, you're going to tempt me to ravish you right here in the lobby and get me arrested and disbarred. Thing is, I want to see you naked but for diamonds dripping over your breasts. Can't afford that if you get me disbarred. She grabbed his lapels and dragged him closer, tiptoeing up to whisper in his ear, I want you to mark me again, on the inside of my thigh. Their energy reverberated, humming, vibrating, until she nearly came from it. I want to lick you until you say my name. You know how you do it, stuttering, breathless, like a sob. It makes my cock hard. Let's go home right now. I just finished for the day. Was on my way down here to bother Renee and wait for you and Gibson, and look at what I found. He kissed her. The kiss left her breathless. We can't. She rested her forehead against his chest. I invited Gibson, my sister, Galen, and Jack to dinner at a moor. He groaned. All right. But we don't need to meet them for another hour or two. Let's go home first. Then you can be all relaxed at dinner. She smiled up at him. You're naughty, and I should feel bad for tempting you off the path of righteousness. But I so don't, you know. I don't think I had much whimsy in my life before you. I enjoyed it, but since you hurtled into my life, I've had a lot of fun. You make me laugh. Fill me with happiness. He kissed her forehead. Not many people are playful with me. You are. That means everything. She swallowed hard, blinking back tears, pressing herself to him, hugging him as tight as she could. Gibson. Kendra and I will go home for a bit and meet you all at the restaurant at seven. Does that work for you, babe? He asked Renee. Totally does. Galen took me there for our anniversary. I love that place. We'll see you then. Gibson, thank you for bringing Kendra here. Gibson bowed with a stiff formality that was more than a run-of-the-mill thank you and you're welcome. That happened at the oddest moments, but Kendra had become sort of charmed by the old-world formality between Max and his family at times. Kendra darted over, kissed her sister's cheek, and rubbed hers along Gibson's. Thank you for everything. I'm glad to have you in my life, helping me. And I didn't forget that you haven't outlined a plan for what comes next in the search for our father. Gibson barked a laugh, taking her hands with a huge smile. Oh, I do like you too. He turned, winking at Renee before giving Kendra his attention again. Tonight at dinner, we'll talk and plan. All right? She nodded. Thank you. Max loved to watch her get dressed. He stood in the doorway to their bathroom and greedily took in the way she slathered on lotion. They'd most energetically fucked both in the garage and on the stairs up to their bedroom. Naked, she glistened under the heat lights while he watched her caress every part of her skin she could reach. He'd been banned from helping with this task the last time when he'd coaxed her into three orgasms as he went down on her all because he'd been helping her get lotion on her back. Really? What was the world coming to when a man got punished for trying to help? Get that look off your face, Max. She met his eyes in the mirror, smiling. Uh-uh. I have lust in my heart for you, Kendra. I'm busy with that just now. We're going to be late if you don't hurry. She narrowed her eyes at him, holding out a hand. No. If you come in here, you know what will happen. That's why I'm trying to get in there. Trying unsuccessfully to hold her laughter back, she pulled on her panties and bra, and he pouted a moment. You're so mean to me. Go. She tossed the deodorant at his head, and he ducked, grinning. He'd meant it when he told her he hadn't really had much fun in his life before her. She made him laugh. Just by thinking about her, his mood lifted. She pleased him even when she was being a bitchy pain in his ass. He'd had lunch with his father. His father had spoken to him of how strong and special Kendra was, and how much he and Imogene had loved how they fit together. And then he'd warned Max about the future. 
He'd wanted to bounce it off Kendra. She saw things in ways he couldn't. He appreciated her candor and her insights. But they'd been busy with love. And who wanted to leave their lover's arms to talk about family politics? Moments later, she came into the bedroom, her lipstick on, her sweater and skirt, hugging every beautiful curve and the highest of heels on her feet. I wish we had more time. Damn, you look good enough to eat. Again. She closed her eyes and he took a step forward. Her eyes snapped open and she fake frowned at him. No. I want to have dinner with my sister. I want to go out on a date and have a nice time. Keep your penis in your underpants, mister. Mean. He let her go, content to watch her brush her hair back with her fingertips and change earrings. You know, watching you get dressed is like being led into a secret club, the way you slather lotion on. He changed lanes and settled back into his seat, the way you always look back over your shoulder at yourself in the mirror, the way you shake your hair out. It's sensual, beautiful. Her lips curved up in her secret smile. You're so good to me. She took his hand a moment, squeezing before she let go. She had no idea what she'd done to his life, how she'd filled it when he didn't know how very empty it had been until she was there, vibrant and warm, and he'd nearly collapsed at the feel of her in that spot that had been vacant. Come on, then. Let's go and eat lots of food. This new metabolism thing rocks my world. I need to say that right now. Amor was safe. When Kendra walked through the doors, everything bad seemed to fall away. She liked that a lot. Liked that this place had been a touchstone for Max and the others in his family. And now it would be hers, too. A space like this would have built up its own sort of protective magics over time. That was a big reason why Renee's place and the De La Vega's house held a ward so well. Not to alarm you, she murmured, as Max settled in next to her at their large private table in the back. But outside... I felt them outside. We're being watched. I'm on it. Gibson spoke to Max without him even saying a word. What rhythm they had. I've known this for a while. Finding their bolt hole worked quite nicely. Helped freshen their scent. They're part of this. He's not out there, neither is she, or I'd be busy. His eyes darkened at the mention of their stepmother. But they have been, and the people watching you and Renee are with them. Stink of them. Kendra leaned forward. And you were going to mention this to me when? You said we would work together. You keeping secrets is not together. Just saying. Max threw himself under the bus. I asked him not to say anything. I wanted you safe, but not worried. Max, we've discussed this more than once. I won't have you making these sorts of choices for me. You are not my parent or even my alpha. You can't hide things this way. He met her gaze, implacable and unshakable in his conviction. I'll do what I need to to keep you safe. You'll do it alone, then. I can't believe we're having this conversation. Again. You either trust me to run this jamboree at your side or you don't. I bet your father doesn't dare hide the sort of thing from your mother. You think I'm less worthy of respect? Galen sighed, leaning back, his hand on Renee's. Her sister narrowed her gaze at Jack and then Gibson. Where is he? My father. You knew too? Kendra turned to Jack, totally livid. Jack looked over at Galen, who heaved another sigh and nodded. Damn it, they'd all known. Renee, you and your sisters knew I was investigating your father's whereabouts. My guards and Gibsons work together, so we share a great deal of intelligence. It's been clear for some time that you've been watched, so that's nothing new. And you knew the possible connection here as well. We only learned of the connection for a certainty yesterday. And yet, you still made the choice for me. She shook her head at Max, totally annoyed he continued to do this. She dismissed that for the time being, needing to stay on task. Where is our father? Gibson blew out a breath. Truly, I don't know that. We're on it, as I told you, Kendra. But there is a connection. You said so yourself. So that's not a surprise to you, is it? What would it have done to tell you, hmm? You know you're being watched. There's a connection. You're aware of all this, so why would I hurt you more by reminding you? There will be times when I do my job without informing you of the whole of it. It's how this job works. 
That's not what this is, and you know it. And I hate how my face wrinkles up when I get so mad, so it's totally digging into how cute I'd be looking right now. Renee laughed, and Max did too, but she turned back to him, putting a hand up. You don't get to laugh. You're in trouble with me right now. However, we'll table this for the time being because it's vulgar to fight at the dinner table in front of others. I didn't do anything wrong. We wanted to be sure, totally sure, before we said anything. I don't want to see that look in your eyes any more often than is necessary. Max took her hand, and while she considered punching him, she chose not to, for the moment. Big dumb butthead was being sweet, even as he was being a pushy, bossy jerk. They've hurt you both so much. I hate that. And I hate that you have to finish this to get closure. But I know you do, and I'm right with you. You can't ask me to not try and spare you more pain. I can't not protect your heart. She let out a long breath, because she was totally defenseless against him. He cared about her and risked her anger to protect her. Even though she knew it wouldn't do to let him get away with this sort of thing, it still touched her. Did you practice that in front of the mirror? He risked a smile, kissing her knuckles. It's the truth. I'd die to protect you from the tears I see in your eyes every time the subject comes up. You're absurdly good at getting out of trouble, she muttered before kissing him. No wonder you're a lawyer. Renee was having her own heated discussion with Jack and Galen, so Kendra took Max's jaw in her hand, holding him in place. No more. I accept that you're nosy and pushy and in my business. I accept that you want to protect me and it means everything. This happened to me, to my mother and my sister. I need to see it end. I need to be part of that. Keeping me away from it doesn't help the way you think it does. It makes me feel out of control, and I really need control here. It's the only way I can manage to get through it. She saw it in his eyes when he'd understood exactly why he had to share this sort of thing with her. His sorrow that he'd missed it, and his resolution to tell her. Oh, he'd do this sort of thing again. It was who he was. But on this particular issue, he'd share everything. And what more could a girl ask for from an alpha cat? All this arguing is ruining my appetite, so I think we should eat instead of fight. She looked to Renee. Her sister had come through some rough times, and Kendra hated that anything else would mar the happily ever after she'd achieved with her two men. From now on, you will share with Kendra and me whenever you receive new information about the situation. There was no question in Renee's statement, and the men all nodded, agreeing. Fine. Let's eat. Gibson filled them in on the investigation. The information about the positive link had truly been the only thing he'd not told her, but it felt better to hear him lay it all out, complete with details about her father's movements. What they'd found, where they'd found it, and what it meant— he was careful and methodical, not drawing any conclusions unless the evidence merited it. You're telling me our father and his wife are working with the mages to steal magic, specifically the ones who've targeted Renee and now me. Kendra sipped her coffee and thought. Gibson nodded slowly. Yes, and they've been a unit for quite a long time. From what we can put together, your father and Susan have been together, at least working together, since the year Kendra was born. Your mother may have been sure then, and that's why she took you to your aunt's. Or she just suspected but couldn't break away herself, so she snuck you out. Kendra tried not to dwell on it just then. She had a job to do. Mary told me about this magic, concealment and protection magic, for one person on behalf of another. If that's what my mother did, it might have been that she stayed in place to make a sacrifice strong enough to keep me hidden and Renee safe. It's just conjecture at this point but the way everything happened doesn't make a whole lot of sense, so it's not that much crazier to think that. And it held true when they'd discussed it. That may be it. Gibson smiled briefly before continuing. We managed to uncover their trail. From Gilroy to Santa Fe, where your stepmother read palms and ran crystal healing seminars. Kendra growled. She probably fleeced those who had true power, stealing their energies like a pickpocket. We've found an arrest. A group of women filed assault charges against her, said she'd physically harmed them during a reading. They let her go, but only after a full day in jail. My contacts in Santa Fe tell me there'd been a lot of suspicion towards Susan and your father the whole time you lived there. 
I can't believe I don't remember that. I have had dreams of deserts and mountains, but that's a common dreamscape, so who knows? Renee spooned up some of Amor's delicious meatball soup. Your memories are beginning to fill in slowly. You'll get it all back, though I wish we could scrub out the bad stuff first. Jack squeezed her hands. Then they lived in New Orleans for a year. Same sort of story. Only this time they were run out of town. I've got investigators down there, seeing if we can't connect up with some of these mages. Perhaps they'd have a reason to give us information if they thought it might hurt your father. Be careful, Gibson. I think it's important not to let these mages know how much power you have. I'd prefer it if you'd keep your distance and let humans deal with the mages when you're poking around. I take the safety of my people seriously. When you brought up the possible risks, I spoke to them about it to be sure they're using local law enforcement and other shifters to get the info to stay out of the picture the best they can. I agree that it's best to keep how much magic we have on the down low until you figure out how to handle this problem. Kendra nodded. Thank you. So after New Orleans? El Paso, Little Rock, and finally Boston, where she opened her shop. I imagine she's stolen magic and life essence from thousands over the years. She's killed for it. Renee spoke, putting her spoon down. I know this. I saw it in her. Have always seen it in her. Not just our mother, but others. Galen's cat shone in his eyes a moment. She wanted to kill you, and there's no reason for us not to believe she wasn't part of selling you out to these other mages. Either way, she'll be dealt with. They can't hide from wolves and cats. Not for long. When we find them, we'll deal with them and end this threat. And then she could truly begin her life, free of the shadow her father had cast on her life for as long as she could recall. Chapter 14 Nice control, Rosemary spoke from the other side of the room as Renee went through her paces in the practice space. Two weeks had passed since the dinner. Not a whole lot of movement in the investigation. It wasn't stalled so much as garnering small bits of information in the wake of a deluge. Max and Gibson both assured her it was a factor in narrowing down and focusing on the target. Gibson said it was often like this right before he got that final piece that broke an investigation open wide. In the meantime, she had classes to teach and classes to take, and a new life to adjust to on several levels. Max had been incredibly generous with his time and knowledge, answering every question, explaining, giving her the tools she'd need to be part of his family. She knew she pestered him, knew it agitated him not to just take over and fix things. But he never made her feel guilty. Even when she saw the exhaustion and annoyance with internal jamboree politics written all over him. Great job to both of you, Rosemary clapped before hugging Renee and then Kendra. I'm so impressed. You're such a natural, Renee smiled, blushing, but clearly pleased with the praise. This is the coolest thing ever. Each new thing I learn makes me want to learn more. Jack grinned at his wife from his perch near the doors. He and Akio were on guard duty, along with Gibson's right-hand man, Saul. Saul, who was also their brother-in-law, married to Diana, the third eldest de la Vega, and a glass artist. The de la Vegas like to keep family business in the family. Saul was pretty awesome, so hanging with him wasn't an imposition at all. He talked more than Gibson, and didn't complain if she wanted to stop for milkshakes on the way home from work. We should get over to dinner, Kendra. Max said he'd meet us there. Five minutes. Let me change into a dress. It's just in the bathroom, so I'll hurry. Max arrived at his parents' home a little early. He'd wanted to speak with his father, but ended up face to face with Beth, who'd wisely been avoiding him. Hey? She rubbed her cheek along his, and not for the first time, he wondered how it was she could be so good to him, so normal and affectionate with him, and so mean to Kendra and Renee. Hey, yourself. He let himself into the foyer and hung his coat up. Why are you here? Is everything all right? Wanted to see Christina while she was around. Christina was their youngest sister, a history professor at Boston University, who was about to leave to spend the next term in Spain with a small group of her students. He smiled. Ah, good. I didn't know if she'd be here tonight. Why? What do you mean, why? She's my sister. I like seeing her. 
She and Kendra get on well, which is nice for my wife, too. No. Why a human? Why not Kelly, who you dated and seemed happy with until this bimbo blew into town? There are so many beautiful, accomplished shifter females who'd have been better suited to you than Kendra. Beth, you don't even know Kendra. So how can you say that? I'm asking you seriously. See, your problem, supposedly, is that she's human. Well, Kendra never was. She's a witch, and now she's a shifter, too. So what's the real deal here? Why are you so dead set against liking her? I think we have enough problems. We have enough solutions, too. We don't need to seek out any outsiders. We're just fine without that. She may have a cat now, but she didn't even get it on purpose. She's rejecting what we are. He pushed from the wall. I told Carlos, and I'll tell you, don't fuck around with me or Kendra on this. As it happens, I agree we've got enough problems. But unlike you, Kendra is trying to help me solve them. Your bitterness is bad for you, bad for me, bad for the jamboree and for that baby you're carrying. Let it go. Just ignore her. I'm not asking you to pretend to like her, though I think you would if you gave her a chance. I'm asking you to act like other families do. You go one way, she goes the other, and no one needs to see any drama. There are children around all the time, soon to be yours. Do you want your baby growing up seeing all this antagonism all the time? If you push her, she's going to push you back. And you know, as well as I do, how it'll end. I'm second born, Max. How do you know it'll end up with Kendra victorious? I would miss you every day for the rest of my life if something happened to you. I love you, even when you're acting a fool. But my wife is a powerful witch, and our bond and taking on a cat has made her even more powerful. She can take you out, and she will if you push. You'll end up excised from your family. You'd break Mommy's heart, and still the result would be the same. Let go of your past hurts. Feel free to dislike my wife all you wish, but shut the fuck up about it already. He turned his back and went up the stairs, where he knew his father waited. Saul nodded to Gibson, who'd driven out to meet them both. There was some sort of ceremonial thing, so Kendra waited patiently for it to conclude, before Gibson held the door to the house open. Come on inside. It's early yet, so you have a chance to see the fire pit and enjoy some quiet before the kids arrive. Renee will be here shortly, though I expect you know that, Kendra paused, noting a deliberate distance where usually he was more open. What's wrong? Gibson's eyes skirted, making full contact with hers. Nothing, just busy. I'll be back shortly. I need to get something from my office. Kendra glanced over at Saul. He's odd today. Saul took her coat. Darlin', he's odd every day. Like clockwork. Go on inside. I hear my wife's voice, and you're good to go now that you're here. He rubbed his cheek along hers and ambled off toward Diana's velvety laugh. Kendra took advantage of not having a guard right on her heels and of the quiet to simply walk through the main part of the house and look at things. She smiled at the pictures on the walls and framed on desks and shelves. So much love in this family, so much respect and understanding, even when they were punching each other in the face. She snorted a laugh and turned to find herself face to face with one of Carlos's friends, a far-flung De La Vega cousin, Ramon. He was like one of those sitcom characters who stood behind the bully and said, yeah, a lot. She should have kept walking, but it was important to stand her ground with him. She was higher ranked and he needed to deal with it. He'd made comments the last time they all had dinner and she was just so very done. She'd promised to do her best to keep attending these dinners, and she knew how much it meant to Max that she did. So if that was going to happen, she needed to start acting like them more. Grinding this douchebag into a greasy spot would be a nice first step. Yes, she asked. What are you doing to my family? This again. I'm beginning to get so bored with you, Ramon. You don't like me, point made. What else is there to add that's not cliched and tedious? He growled, and she raised a brow his way. It wasn't that she was afraid of him, but that she hated having to do this because she hated harming Max. Doesn't it matter to you that this hurts Max? That it hurts your aunt and uncle who are doing their best to lead this jamboree in such troubling times? Do you have no shame? 
It bothered her, this sort of thing. Not that she expected everyone to like her. That wouldn't be normal in any family. But this faction in the Jamboree didn't seem to care how much damage they did. They didn't even seem to think about the repercussions of what they did. And that was dangerous. He'd be better off without you anyway. I'd be doing him a favor. She didn't bother with her snort of derision at the statement. He needed a spanking. And Max had stressed over and over that she had to give one to make a point. So she spooled up her energy, letting him see it, hoping he'd back off. But he seemed too stupid to get it and fear. Don't use your filthy magic here, witch. This, of course, was the worst possible thing he could say. It pushed many of her buttons and had her fisting her hands to keep from popping him one. Some mouth you've got on you. I'll use my magic anywhere I please. I don't need your permission. I outrank you. Now back off. He moved so fast she would have missed it, were she not a shifter as well. But she was and she saw the razor-sharp claw coming at her face and jerked to the side as she brought a warding hand up, sending her energy through it, enough to lift him from the gorgeous hardwood floor. And enough that when she let go, he clattered down, the breath whooshing from his lips. It was then Max let his presence be known with a snarled growl. Then he reached down, grabbed his cousin by the scruff of the neck, and hauled him up the steps before tossing him out the front door. Kendra watched in awe at how Max moved, as he followed his cousin, getting close enough to own the other man's personal space. You're barred from jamboree gatherings for sixty days. He hauled off and punched his cousin square in the face. That's for showing claw to my wife. He punched him again. And that's for being so stupid. You'd do it after you were warned. It was at that point she noticed they had an audience. She'd knocked Ramon on his ass in front of pretty much his entire family, and none of them seemed mad. Not even Beth, who shrugged and walked away. Kendra, would you please come up with me? Max asked, or, well, he sounded like he asked, but she knew she needed to speak to the alpha pair about what had happened. But he didn't take her directly to the office. He hustled her down a long, quiet hallway and into a room that still scented strongly of him. This is your old room. Are you all right? She looked around at the space that, despite several decades of his absence, retained his presence. I'm fine. She turned, looking up into his face, treasuring it already. Are you mad? She found herself on her back, on his bed, Max looming over her, the light of passion in his eyes, and a very ready cock pressing against her mound. Then she smiled. You're a filthy boy. You have no idea what it does to me to see you like that. Tough, in charge, owning your role. He said it, but the words were nearly a snarl as desire overtook him. He needed her so badly he couldn't see straight. And take me, she whispered, and he knew she'd felt the blast of his want through their bond. And he drowned in her, taking, giving, consuming her, giving over to the near-narcotic effect she had on him, on his cat, sure in the knowledge as they slid skin to skin that he'd found home. Wow. She spoke from where she'd burrowed into his side, something else about her he adored. She sought him out, taking comfort from his body. It meant everything. Glad you're not mad. Even without seeing her expression, he knew she teased, a smile on his lips that would be kiss-swollen. I'm mad at him, at the situation. It's a waste of time better spent on other things. But it's not about you. This sucks. She paused and started to laugh. Not this part. This part's pretty awesome. But I think I've had my fill of my family acting like they've lost their damned minds. I hate that it hurts you. I'm sorry for that. Sorry I had a part in it. If it would be easier, I can stop coming to these things. He growled, pinching a cheek of the ass he could write epic poems to. Not yours to make up for. Now, let's get dressed and set to rights. I was with my father just before you arrived. He says he's got something to tell us. Oh, great. So everyone's gonna know we came up here and got it on. Icing is that your parents will know. Blushing, she headed toward the bathroom. You ripped my hose. Yeah, well, you're going to need to carry around a change of such things. Or I can tuck them in a drawer or my pocket. 
he leered as she disappeared into the bathroom. Or you could control your lustful impulses. They both laughed at that. By the time he'd gotten himself dressed and straightened, she came out looking beautifully unmust, though it would have been impossible not to see the glow she had about her. Don't need hose anyway. Your legs are perfect. She smiled, flattered. Thank you for saying so. But they're cold. In case you haven't noticed, it's April. In case you haven't, your body temperature should be higher. Aren't you warmer since you took on your cat? He zoomed in, sliding himself against her, covering her in a scent. I am now, but we just had sex, so back off and let's go deal with your parents. She turned in his arms, straightening his collar and smoothing down the front of his shirt. Handsome. Is this bad, do you think? Is there trouble? I don't know. But given the way things are going, I'd wager there's something up. Yes. Jeez. His mother was ending a phone call as they knocked and entered the office. Max scented his father's emotions, could feel the pull of them as they shut the door. I'm sorry to pull you two away, but there are some recent developments we need to discuss with you. Cesar sighed heavily. Thank you, beauty, for setting Ramon to rights. I've heard word about it. Gibson says you handled yourself well. Nicely done to ban him for a time. Perhaps with some cooling off, your cousin can find his head. It's wedged up his ass, so don't wait too long, darling. Imogene threw her hands up, totally frustrated. His mother is the same. Spoiled all those boys so much, they think they're smart, when actually they got the short end of the intelligence stick. I'm sure you're right, Cesar winked, a little bit of levity lightening the cloud around him. And yet I find myself here in possession of information I must speak with you about. Max looked to his mother, who motioned for him to sit. Taking Kendra's arm, he led her to the sofa and sat, her body against his. I have spoken to Gibson about this already. I apologize for speaking to him first, but it had to be done. Two years ago, Carlos began to make business decisions that I found myself questioning. Money wasn't adding up. Max felt himself grow very cold and very still. He realized Kendra was not surprised and wondered why he could be so blind. She pressed into him, enough that he understood it was her way of comforting him, without calling too much attention to it. The cold eased, but not entirely. I didn't go to you with my concerns because I didn't want it to be true, and I didn't want to involve you in something that could potentially bring a rift to the jamboree, especially without enough evidence. I spoke to Gibson, to have him look into it discreetly. I'll have him get you the file tomorrow, but the story is that your brother began to run with some radical humans. Wait, what does this have to do with embezzling money? And why the hell would human radicals want to be with him? He's a shifter. His father scrubbed his hands over his face. Max noted his mother's body language. The tension in her was anger, not pain. If only it was theft. If only it was simply that. At first I limited his ability to get at our resources. Shifted his job responsibilities so he couldn't touch much. All his reimbursements have come straight to me since. I've said no a few times, and since then, he's been more careful. At the time, I thought that was it and relaxed a little. Gibson didn't find any gambling debt, no evidence of a drug problem or general levels of high debt. Cesar huffed out a breath. But my discomfort didn't alleviate. It rode me all the time, and I asked Gibson to keep looking. And then we found the beginnings of what we confirmed totally just this morning. The travel and the people he seemed to be hanging out with suddenly connected. He's got all this hatred of humans, but I think he hates himself more. They allow him to hang around because he's their devil. Here's the evil shifter. Look at him. He is so dangerous. He's telling us how dangerous he is. Kendra shifted against him, stiffening. And who's worse than a shifter? A human who'd mate with one, or who'd become one. Traitors to their own race, Kendra spoke, and it hit Max so hard he had to shove his cat back with both hands. Cesar nodded. I expect you've heard that a time or two, yes? Max looked back and forth between his father and his wife, as the horror of it began to settle into his bones. My former in-laws were like that. They belonged to some anti-shifter group, thinly masquerading as a religion. They said stuff like that all the time. They gave me shots. When they held me to cure me, 
birth control shots so their son wouldn't have any devil babies. They told me if I just underwent their treatment I'd be cured and able to bear children. She tried to stand and he turned to her. The ice was back. These people had harmed far too many and they needed to pay for it. Garida, don't let them get to you anymore. You're here with me. That's all in your past. I've already had Gibson looking into it, making sure we know where they are. He had their number and planned to make a call very soon. I brought this into your life. She took a deep breath, looking back to his father. That's how Gibson found out, isn't it? In some freakish convergence of all the things he was looking into. Something connected Carlos with the group. Or a group like the ones my ex's family was part of. He sprang from the couch, needing to pace. His cat agitated and vengeful. Is he high? Has he gone insane? It's the only way to explain this. Max seethed as his father motioned him to sit back down. Cesar turned to Kendra. This isn't about you. Not at all. We knew he was up to something. We just didn't have the final piece until this morning. For nearly three years, he's been going on vacations with these people, letting them use him for propaganda. He's been advocating the wholesale sterilization of any human women who mate with shifters. Gibson is working on it with two teams. I expect we'll know a lot more by tomorrow morning. What are you planning to do? Max wanted to hurt his brother for even thinking of doing what he'd been doing. I want you to act as if nothing has changed tonight. I'm sorry, I know it's a lot to ask, especially after I've just told you all this. But I don't want to tip our hand before we know more. I don't want him to get away, Imogene said it, her voice shaking with anger. That is no longer my son. She stood and Kendra followed, putting her arm around his mother's waist. Imogene, I'm so sorry. I wish I could help in some way. I know what it feels like to find out someone who should love you has betrayed you. I'm sorry you have to feel it. His mother met his eyes a brief moment. Hers was an expression filled with emotion, most of it gratitude. Christ, how did this happen? Is there any chance at all that this is a mistake? He knew it was false hope, knew Gibson's skills were unparalleled, but he asked anyway. His father looked so very sad. That's why I'm asking you to act as if nothing has happened. There are pictures, video clips even. Carlos speaking on his infection, on this curse, hate mail with his face on it. For three years he betrayed us all, whipped up even more anger and hysteria that could have gotten any number of us harmed or killed. He's guilty, and I wish it weren't so. You and I will hold on to that sliver of a chance that he's involved in some super-secret military operation to bring these hate groups to justice. And when the inevitable comes, and there's nothing left but total certainty, we'll know we never totally gave up on him until we had no choice. This could destabilize everything you're trying to build. This will only make the anti-human sentiment stronger. Kendra spoke as she squeezed Imogene's hand one last time and returned to Max's side. It can, yes. I'm afraid that's true. Max, you and Galen need to work together on ways to move our culture forward in the wake of the devastation this will leave. I expect we'll be challenged for leadership at least twice. I'm old, but not entirely helpless. Cesar turned his gaze on Max, and he understood the other shoe was about to drop. You want me to take over? Kendra put her head on his shoulder. Her fear jittered through her system, radiating into his heart. There is no one in this jamboree who could best you. You know that. Cesar stood, strolling over to the bank of windows and looking out over the yard where family had begun to gather. Max was in vain, but he knew his strengths as well as his weaknesses. He was Alpha and his father was correct. In truth, the chances of receiving a challenge would go down if Max took over. The certainty of losing and losing badly was total. Cats understood how things worked in much the same way humans did. The strong and the cunning ran things, and if they were strong and cunning enough, everyone lived well and safely. The potential threat to his cats, to his family, had filled his system with adrenaline, and Kendra spoke softly. You need to calm, or they'll feel you and wonder what's going on. If you're going to take over, do it right. Do it decisively. Imogene's face registered surprise and then pleasure. 
Max felt that approval from the toughest judge he had ever known, and it humbled him. You're right, Garida. Are you on board for this? If I run the jamboree, you do too. It'd be a huge commitment, and there'd be cats at our house all the time. Meetings. You'd have to run a lot of meetings. There already are cats at our house all the time. You have guards. Gibson practically lives with you. Um, us. This is the future. You may not have planned it this way, but it's here. And now you have to do what you're supposed to do. I'm happy to help in whatever way I can. I only ask the space to find my father and deal with him. He kissed her forehead. I'm behind you totally on that. I expect since Gibson will be so busy on this situation, we can have Jack's people help more. I'll make sure you get the help you need on this. Akio has been keeping me updated on everything. I'll speak with him and Jack, explaining everything. Or, well, what I can, anyway. Are you all sure I should be doing this? There will be so much upheaval when Carlos is exposed for what he's done. Should we add a former human witch to the mix? His mother waved a hand at that. I've been alive long enough to see a great many things. Coming out to humans was the biggest, and we survived it. My son's cat chose you. Your own cat chose you. You are meant to be here and meant to help Max and your cats through this. I know it. Kendra shrugged. All right, then. I expect I'll need help, so get ready for all my phone calls. His mother smiled. Of course. They spent another twenty minutes discussing the transition. Max wanted his father to continue on with the day-to-day -day running of the jamboree. He'd done it for thirty years and had done it well. The continuity would help. He hated this moment, hated knowing his brother was capable of such hatred against his own people, hated knowing people said these things to his wife. But he had no room for it just then because he had to pretend everything was fine and smile as his father handed over the reins. Chapter 15 I'm sorry you had to find out this way, Gibson murmured as they all came downstairs. Kendra was shocked and off balance, even as she sought that calm place to pretend everything was hunky-dory. I understand the why, but from now on, you'll report to me. Max stood tall, regal, she realized, owning his role completely. Gibson nodded solemnly. Of course, congratulations, and I mean that. Let's grab some food, I'm starving. Kendra figured if they all ate, things would be less tense. Hungry shifters were a very agitated bunch. Max grinned, taking her hand. As always, very forward-thinking. Don't get used to it, but why don't I make you a plate? It'll give you a chance to sit and visit, and I can mill around. I know there are already rumors about Ramon, so why not just be up front and in their faces? When he leaned down to kiss her, she whispered in his ear instead. I believe in you and all your limitless potential, Max. You can do this. He took her hands and slipped a ring on her finger, catching her totally off guard. I've had this for a few weeks. I wanted to give it to you at the right time. Since we're about to start an even wilder ride than marriage, I realized this might be it. She looked at it, at the band filled with diamonds, and knew he got her more than anyone else ever could. It was a simple ring, not flashy, though certainly filled with plenty of awe-inspiring sparkle. He knew her, and that filled her with so much pleasure, she nearly made a very girly squee sound. Instead, she grinned up at him, not caring who saw it, throwing her arms around him for a big hug as she thanked him before nuzzling his neck. I take it you like the ring? His pleasure rolled through their bond. I love it. You're the best thing that's ever happened to me. You know that, right? His smile softened. I never knew what it meant to be in love before you. Making you smile has become one of my to-do list items every day. Now, go get me some food, woman, before I grow breasts and turn into a girl with all this talk. She laughed, swatting his very fine behind and ambling off toward the big buffet table. Max watched her through the evening, watched as she charmed those members of his family who may have been on the fence. Watched as they assessed her now that they knew she'd tossed Ramon on his ass. She didn't really get it, not yet. But that bit of viciousness from her had taken her light years forward in the eyes of his cats. Of their cats. 
When his father made the announcement, which would be any moment now as he was just finishing his ramble about some upcoming family stuff, the other cats would understand that Kendra was more than capable of running the jamboree and protecting them from threats. He still wanted to kill Ramon for daring to move against his wife, though. Oh, and his stupid fuck-all brother, who'd lost his damned mind. Renee shifted, leaning closer to Kendra. The sisters had created a bond he admired and knew would serve them both well. Renee was very well respected after years of struggle to make her place in the jamboree, and Kendra openly credited that with her own success. They were unified and strong, and it pleased him inordinately to see it. Lastly, this evening, I wanted to let you all know I'm turning the jamboree over to my next in line, and his wife, as of right now. It's not much of a surprise, as Max has been the declared next in line for nine years now. Imogene and I have discussed it amongst ourselves and then with Max and Kendra, and we have every confidence they will lead this jamboree into a new era, blessed by even more success and happiness. Cesar delivered the lines and smiled at the assembled group, like he hadn't just tossed a bomb into their midst. Kendra looked to Max, showing him her heart on her face. He'd needed that just then, and sent her a grin back as he hauled her to her feet, bracing an arm around her waist to hold her there. I know we haven't had a transition here in over thirty years, so I wanted to encourage everyone to remember my door is always open if you have a concern or question. Kendra and I really look forward to this new phase. I'll shut up now so we can get to dessert. Galen stood, bowing his head. Gibson followed. Diana, Christina, and Armando, and, much to Max's surprise, Beth. Nearly the entire rest of those assembled followed. It wasn't fake. The rush of fidelity and trust swelled through the bond his father had handed him. He held them all inside. And instead of fear, he realized how monumentally awesome it was to experience. Kendra, while touched by the show of support by nearly everyone in the room, wasn't impressed by those who didn't show it. Carlos sat sullenly as far from them as he could and still be in the room. A few like him dotted the space, and she wanted to knock some sense into them. She kept her eyes on him, waiting for the moment when he peeked up from his pout. And when he did, she sent him a look that told him just what she thought of his behavior. It might have been small to be pleased by the way he flinched, but so be it. She had no doubts at all that he was guilty of what Gibson alleged. She knew Gibson well enough, had seen him at work often enough to know he didn't play around when it came to investigation and building a case. If he took it to Cesar, he could back it up. And given what a disgusting, cowardly piece of crap Carlos was, it wasn't as hard for Kendra to believe it as she thought it might be for those who loved him, like Max. She narrowed her eyes at Carlos as he dared to glance at her again. This time, he actually tried to hold her gaze and challenge. And she simply stared, unblinking, letting him see every ounce of loathing she had for him. Max squeezed her as they sat back down. What's going on? <sighs> Just letting Carlos know what I think of his not standing up. Gibson barked a laugh and patted her hand. Aw, oh, bebe, you're going to do just fine. Do you have a few minutes later on, at your house? We can talk about the other work I'm doing. Jack leaned around Galen, stealing a stuffed mushroom from his plate as he did. I'd like to be in on that one. I have some new information as well. Why don't we head over there after dinner, then? Max slid a thumb along the inside of her wrist as he spoke, sending a slow pulse of pleasure through her system, fogging her brain. Leaning in close, she nuzzled his neck before speaking quietly to him. You're making me all loopy with that. Stop. His grin in response told her he knew exactly what he was doing. Her phone rang. Normally she'd have ignored it, but as she saw her uncle's number on the screen, she had a feeling, a very strong feeling, she should answer. Excuse me. She got up and found a reasonably quiet corner to answer. Max felt it through their bond, saw the sag in her spine, and was at her side in moments. What is it? That was my uncle. My ex contacted him, fished for details about me. He knows I'm here in Boston. His cat surged to the fore, and she noted it, placing her palms on his chest. Shh, it's okay. 
I have you. I have several giant shifter males all quite happy to hurt anyone on my behalf. I'm nervous, but not in the same way I would have been even six months ago. Right before he'd met her and his entire world had upended and changed for the better. Let's head home anyway. We can talk to Gibson and Jack about this newest development. And he could let his guard down a little at home, surrounded by those he trusted implicitly. Stop. Stop the car. Max jerked the car to a halt with a squeal of tires, barely in time to stop his foolhardy wife from falling out the door she attempted to fling open, even as the car still moved. What the fuck? He slammed the locks on. Damn it, Kendra. You're going to get killed. Turn, turn here. Now, now. The cars that had been following screeched to make the turn he did. His phone began to ring, and he thrust it at Kendra. You have to tell them whatever you're doing. Just follow us. I feel him. At the end of the thread, I connected to him. She disconnected, and if he hadn't been trying not to kill them both, he'd have laughed at the expression he knew had to be on Gibson's face. Her head fell back against the seat, and he began to slow. Her hand reached out, grabbing his wrist and digging in. He's out there. Don't stop until I say. Keep heading. Get on. Get on 93 North. Yes, North. Go, Max. He barely made the on-ramp, but he sped north on her orders. His cell rang again, and this time, he flipped on the stereo to answer it that way. De La Vega. Mind telling me where we're going? Galen's voice sounded. Kendra had her eyes closed, lines of concentration on her face, so he didn't want to disturb that. She's taking us to her father, I think. Call Rosemary and let her know what's going on. Get Gibson on it, too. You may as well stay on the line and listen so you know where we're going. Renee spoke in the background, making the calls, and Max smiled for a moment. The sisters worked together. Off! She sat bolt upright, pointing at an off-ramp. He bit off an annoyed comment and took the ramp, keeping it slow, listening to her and letting her lead. They hit dead ends a few times, and he'd have to stop and let her listen to whatever inner map she had until they could find a way around it. It was incredible that the two cars following had kept with them the whole time. Gibson would never let him hear the end of this. She opened her door, having used her magic to override the locks he'd thrown back near his parents' house. At first, she just stood there, listening, cocking her head. And then she was off like a shot, down a long block. Cursing a blue streak, he managed to get the jag parked, grab the keys, and follow, only barely resisting his urge to yell her name. Up ahead of him, she ran, graceful and full of fury. Her legs were long as she ate up the pavement, but his were longer. He'd catch up to her soon enough. Gibson was craftier, as he reached Kendra first, obviously having taken a shortcut through a nearby alley. Her rage pulsated not only through their bond, but in the air all around her. Her sorrow and confusion, too. She tried to maintain a hard-assed stance, but he knew this had to hurt her. How could it not? His cat clawed his insides, trying to get her to fix whatever was wrong. Kendra saw them, standing not too far away. She wondered at Max's ability to not scream her name as she'd taken off, but thank goodness he'd kept quiet, so she could get the drop on them. She'd spooled up her power as she ran, letting her cat keep focus on her quarry as she got her magic ready to go. When she skidded to a halt, she sent out a blast of energy strong enough to knock her father on his ass. Susan turned, seeing her and sneering. She sent a blast Kendra's way. But now an entire jamboree of jaguars lived in her. There was water nearby, trees, grass, apartment buildings, and houses. So much energy. She drew a small wisp of it, pulled it into herself, and rebounded that blast back at Susan. Because the magic Susan had tossed was so vile and toxic, it stuck to the other woman like shit. Apt. But she wasn't totally out. Susan hit her again twice more, and her father aided that bitch, amping her power up. Dimly in the back of her mind, she felt Max through their bond, Max barreling down the block, getting closer and closer. It burned, blacking her vision out for a long moment before she grabbed more of the energy around her and brought it into herself. She allowed herself to tap into her cats, 
just a small bit and blasted back at them both so hard. Susan ended up with her husband, on her ass, on the ground. The pounding of Max's approach vibrated through her shoes, up her legs. The wash of his energy, of his fury, boiled over, shoving everything from his way. He was a badass freight train of pissed-off protective alpha male. Hey, guess what? I got married. That sound is my husband coming. What the fuck do you think you're doing? Her father asked, his voice thready and freaked. He understood who she was. There was no way around it. She knew how much she looked like her mother and Renee. That he could be so nasty, even after what he'd done, made her crazy. It felt as if her cat actually paced inside her body. What? No tearful reunion? I might have to go to therapy now. He tried to move, but found himself stuck to the spot. She felt him try to draw on her and shocked him, slamming him out so violently he stepped back, holding the hand he'd been working the spell with. She'd pay for that later. A nosebleed had started, but the nice thing about this shifter business was that it stopped nearly immediately. She stood back as the blur moved to the side, grabbing her father by the scruff of his neck and slamming him against the side of a nearby car, setting off the alarm. I got that, Renee said quietly as they arrived using her energy to short the alarm out. Kendra realized how exposed and in the open they were. But Max was barely holding on to his human skin, as his protective instincts raged within him. She'd need Gibson's help to get the situation under control. Let's get this away from the noise, Gibson said carefully to Max, staying in Max's line of sight, urging calm. His hands were loose and at his sides, his gaze averted from Max's eyes accepting the other man's dominance. Max seemed to relax a tiny bit, as Jack spoke up from just to the side, where he'd been waiting with Renee. We're out here in the street where anyone can see. Over here, Rosemary approached with Mary. They stood at the entrance to a nearby park. You made it fast, Max murmured to them as they hustled Andrew and Susan over, cats and wolves fanning out to set a perimeter. Mary sat up at dinner and told me to get in the car, we were driving to your place when we got the call. Renee talked us here. Rosemary shrugged before turning her gaze back to where Susan and her father were. You are to move carefully to that park and sit on the bench you're told to. If you don't, I'll drain you until you can't move on your own. Kendra had never seen her aunt so vicious. But it was clear she meant it, and they both seemed to understand she was serious. Even if Susan had a look on her face so obnoxious, Kendra wanted to slap it off. Yes, let's. She leaned in close as they walked, keeping an eye on them. Max growled, putting himself back between them again. Mary did something, and the sounds around them dampened. That was so cool. Kendra planned to ask her about it later. This will give us some privacy for a time. For now, she had other concerns. She motioned to Max, who had his arm around her waist his lips pulled back in a snarl as he looked towards Susan and her dad. Now, here's the thing. He's a protective alpha jaguar shifter. They don't come in other flavors. And he's really mad. At you. Which, well, I guess that means it sucks to be you. Mary flanked the bench on one side, Rosemary on the other. We've got it handled for now. They needed to move this along or get inside. The nearest safe place was fifteen miles behind them, though, so it was time to improvise. Now back to me for a moment. I'm a witch, too. Surprise! But you knew that, didn't you, you naughty boy? So you should also know that if you try to use any magic on anyone here, I'll suck you dry and not feel a thing. If not me, Mary will, or even Aunt Rosemary. I'm sure she's got a lot of anger with you over that murder thing. You know the thing where you and your bitch killed our mother? Oh, that was quite out of bounds. So you need to understand this. She focused on Susan, who was far more powerful than her father. You're some piece of work, aren't you? I should throw you to these very unhappy boys to deal with. It was Galen who growled that time, and satisfaction bloomed through her belly at the way Susan flinched. So to wrap up, these people are my family. I will kill you to save them, and I can. I've learned a bunch of nifty new spellcraft. It would be self-defense. 
so keep your shit together. Don't cause a scene, and you might just end up walking away alive at the end. Would it be easier to take care of this piece of shit if I make him bleed? Max's voice would have scared the hell out of her if she hadn't known him. Thank you, baby, but I think we're okay for now. If blood were spilled, it could be a lot harder to keep Max and the other shifters calm. Max leaned down, getting right in her father's face. You have harmed my woman and my sister. You seek to harm them still. Why should you be allowed to live? That's a good question, Jack added. Not that I'm opposed to killing him or anything, but how about we get some answers first? Like, say, what they're doing here, where his compatriots are, who these contacts that have been routinely attacking our women are. Those little details. Gibson slowly, making sure Max saw it and didn't react negatively, put himself in between the two men, taking over. Max reluctantly moved back, shifting to stand in between Kendra and her father. I need to see him, she murmured, sliding her hand up and down his arm. She'd never seen him so close to the edge. That such a controlled man would be on the verge of shifting because of a perceived threat to his mate. No one had ever reacted to protect her the way he did. He wants to hurt you, she nodded. He does, but he can't right here. He brushed his lips against hers. I'm not going to let him hurt you again. She nodded again. I know. Thank you, Max. He seemed to be satisfied with that. Sort of. If he tries anything, Gibson, anything at all, break his fucking neck. Not enough to kill, just, you know, paralyze him. He can still talk with a broken spine. Kendra took Renee's hand and they cautiously moved closer, far more concerned about the enraged and protective males than with their father. She bent, taking her shoes off, immediately getting a boost to her energy. The cold woke her up, sharpened her focus. That's better. So you know, they're not joking about the broken neck thing. So let's just quit any ideas of trying to get away without giving us answers. If we can do this right, you might live. Maybe. Renee waved at Andrew. Hi there, Dad. I wish I could say it was nice to see you, but since you murdered Mom and have been cooperating with people who tried to kill me, I have to say I'm feeling far less fond of you these days. He tried to come off as upset and rude, but his fear stank. It didn't stop him from using yet another chance to lash out at his youngest daughter. Renee, what are you doing with these people? I thought you knew better than to consort with thugs and idiots. Look at them. Not even human. Shifters, for God's sake. They're lesser beings and you give your body to them. And that trash who says she's your sister. How do you know that for sure? Kendra snorted. Thank goodness I got my intelligence from Mom's side of the family. I think the question is, what do you think you're doing? I don't have to tell you anything. You're no one to me. Gibson punched him in the face. Thank you, Gibson. I feel much better now. Kendra turned back to her father. Now, shall we do this again? Why don't we start with why you killed our mother? You can't win. We're stronger. Mary snorted. Please, Andrew, you have no real concept of your power and how little you have. She touched him and Susan sprang to try and keep them separate. Rosemary grabbed a hank of Susan's hair and yanked her back into place. Don't move again, bitch, Kendra sighed. You're so silly. You're not here by choice, are you? Your nose isn't bleeding because you were so strong you could hold the shifter back when he wanted to punch you. I don't have a dick to measure against yours, so let's just not play this game. He sent a bolt of energy toward her, knocking her sideways. Max made a choking sort of roar that freaked her father out so much, making him so pale. Kendra wondered if he'd pass out. If this didn't move forward soon, Max would shift and eat him or just flay him alive. Or whatever. Oh, now that was ill-advised. She dusted her hands off while Gibson increased the pressure of his grip on Andrew's throat. Dumb of both of us. I shouldn't have let my guard down and you shouldn't have thought you'd be successful. The only reason you're not dinner for my husband right now is me. You got that? Use my energy, Kendra. I know you're holding back and I'm gonna kick your ass if you don't do what you need 
to take care of this. Max spoke quietly in her ear. She wanted to speak with him in private, but she didn't want to take her attention away from Susan. The hit had tasted like her magic, not his. Her muddy, disgusting magic, fueled most likely by the bloody nose they'd caused. She squeezed Max's hand. Gibson, can you stand back a moment? Mary asked. Mary did something, Kendra thought she altered the molecules around her father's body, starving him of oxygen for just a short burst. Kendra was already skirting the line by using magic to hold him in place, though she told herself it was self-defense. Mary had a different view of her magic and how she could use it. The cost would be between her and the universe, and it was one she willingly and knowingly took on. Kendra was not so vain that she'd tell the other woman what to do in this situation. He looked to her, his eyes wide as he wheezed until she let go, watching him choke for air. You only have yourself to blame. Just be glad he didn't break your neck instead. Kendra shrugged. Bebe, I may have to start bringing you along when I go out on jobs. Gibson grinned back at her, his grip on her father's throat again. And with that, three more mages entered the park. Kendra knew this because she felt the swell of their intent, the beginnings of something dark and unwholesome. Get down, she screamed, as she, Mary, Rosemary, and Renee stood in a line, keeping Susan and their father behind them. Don't you let these assholes get away. She motioned back at her father and Susan. That's when Jack popped Susan one first, and then while Andrew was still shocked, Max growled and punched her father. They're out, and you better watch your pretty ass, Jack called as Max materialized behind her. Wolves and cats fanned out, flanking the three mages who'd entered the park. Don't get too close. Max, if you get yourself hurt, I'm going to hurt you even more. He snorted in her ear, standing right behind her, his arm around her waist. And if you don't draw energy from me, I'll hurt you. Tough guy. If they lived through this, she might go for some old-fashioned punishment. Heh. <laughs> you are not welcome here, Rosemary called out, and they hit her so hard she lost her footing, falling back. Slices into her skin, the coppery tang of blood in the air, in her nose. Max pushed around her and ran toward the man who'd made her bleed. One moment he wore his human skin, the next he was his cat, black and sleek with razor-sharp teeth and claws that gleamed in the yellowy light of the street lamps. He hit one of them, taking them down with a scream, a garbled scream and crunch. She lost focus for a moment, and that cost her dearly as she took a hit from one of the remaining mages. It hurt. So much she could barely hold on to her magic, but she did and she yanked it back from the mage, trying to steal it from her. Instead, she took his, drawing it from him with a snap that took him to his knees. Renee, damn, her sister kicked butt as she sent energy to Kendra, healing energy that began to soothe immediately. Draw on him. You know it's what you have to do, Kendra. Take his weapon against you or he will win. Rosemary screamed as she fought. Sigils sparked in the air between the two groups as magic met stolen magic. But the stolen magic felt different than her own magic. It didn't belong to the mage throwing it her way. She'd need to think on that later, if she survived. But right then she grabbed it and pulled, pulled hard, as she drew the magic from the mage nearest to them. It filled her, dark and roiling. But it powered the spell she was working, made her stronger, even as her system registered it as an intrusion. Things were a blur as she worried for Max and her cats, worried for her sister, Mary and Rosemary, worried for the wolves. In the midst of her worry, she still had a job to do, so she did it. She let her magic take over, let that part that intuited her use of power take over. Lights flashed, lights no one outside the park could see. Her energy waned, but she knew the mages were worse off because she'd drained one. He'd fallen to his knees, disappearing under the weight of a shiny black wolf. A Keo, she'd have guessed. One still stood. She stumbled forward, feeling Max through the bond but not seeing him. Renee had moved to Rosemary's side, and Mary stood alone in the middle of the grass, locked in a magical battle with the last mage. They seemed to be well-matched. 
though she worried for Mary and everyone else. Things happened so fast all around her, shouts, lights, the stench of burning flesh and blood. Her cat pushed forward, relishing the sights and sounds of battle. And then something hard and heavy struck the back of her head, the world exploding in vibrant color for moments until things faded and she hit the cold, wet ground. Chapter 16 She knew she was alive because she hurt too much to be otherwise. She got to her knees in time to see Max running toward her at full speed. He blurred a moment and caught her up into his arms, as he shifted back to his human form. Are you all right? One-handed, he felt around and she found enough energy to be amused. Just a tiny bit. Put me down. This isn't over. Mary came over. It is for now, sweetheart. Susan got away, I'm sorry to say. She's the one who hit you. But we still have your father and the clan which has just arrived. Max set her gently back on her feet as two very businesslike witches approached. Mary indicated the newcomers. Kendra and Max. These are the hunters I spoke of, from the Rodas clan down in Providence. She reeled at the news of her stepmother escaping, but had to keep her shit together yet one more time. Max squeezed an arm around her. A tall, broad witch with pale blonde hair, blowing around his face, stood forward. I'm Callahan Peters. You can call me Cal. And this is Miles Dolan. He pointed to the man next to him. This one with close-shaven dark hair and wary brown eyes. I'm Kendra de la Vega, and this is my husband, Max. Thank you for coming to help. I'm sorry Susan Tolliver got away. We've been looking for her for years, and I can't believe she was here in Boston all this time. But we have her accomplice, your father, I hear. Another man approached. This one hummed with power, and Kendra knew he was far more powerful than the other two. I am Errol Haas, the hunter of the Rodas clan. He shook Max's hand first, the two men never taking their eyes from the other. Some sort of dominance crap, she assumed, waiting not so patiently for it to be over. Finally, he turned to Kendra and shook her hand, speaking to both of them. Please accept our apologies for not arriving sooner. With your permission, we'll take your father and the two remaining mages to see what we can find out. Take them where? Her voice sounded rusty, but she was regaining feeling in her fingers, and the cuts all began to heal. They were magical wounds and would take longer to heal, even with her shifter boost, than a normal injury would. Max held her closer. My wife is bleeding. Her aunt has an arm that may be broken, and my people have been injured. We're standing in the middle of a public park out in the open. So perhaps now might be the time for you to tell us where you're taking this trash and why we should let you. Errol raised an eyebrow but nodded before he spoke again. We have facilities where we can hold them without a chance of escape. And if they won't cooperate, we have techniques to extract information if they fail to be forthcoming. You're not equipped to handle this here. You must know that. But we do, and we're happy to share what we find. I know these people murdered your mother, and we've been told they attempted to drain one of you, and have been attacking other witches in the area. This makes them an enemy to all which kind and my job to deal with. Mary had joined them and spoke up. He's telling the truth. I've spoken with Sadira Rodas, and I've followed her career over the years. She runs a tight ship in Providence, and I believe they are far better able to handle this than we are. We can't hold them, Kendra. Not without keeping them so drugged, we'd be unable to get any information from them. Sadira would like me to let you know how much she'd enjoy meeting you and working with you in the future. I give you our word to share everything we gain from these people. You are free to come down now if you'd like to watch us work. Or come tomorrow. Whichever you prefer. With a flourish, Errol handed business cards to them. Kendra nodded. All right, then. Yes. Errol motioned to Cal and Miles. And the remaining mages, including her unconscious father, were whisked away and into a van parked just outside the park entrance. She's not coming tonight. She needs rest. Mary looked her over and shook her head. Max hummed his agreement. Jack and Galen were busy fussing over Renee, who allowed it. Kendra didn't blame her sister. Heaven knew how much she wanted to simply let Max drive her home so she could throw up a few times and pass out. 
Kel returns to them. You'll feel ill for some time from drawing the magic into yourself. But your body knows what to do and you'll expel it within a few hours. That sounds pleasant, Cal laughed. Well, I've done it a few hundred times by this point. It's not what I'd call fun, but I'm not a shifter either. Your ability to heal yourself should be greater because of that. I will be in contact with you first thing. Errol bowed slightly toward them. Sadira would very much like to meet you and speak about this mess. The situation is fluid, changing very quickly and not always for the best. All right, we'll speak to you then. I'm getting Kendra home. I'd take her to the hospital, but she'd refuse to get out of the car. But I know for damn sure I don't want her standing out here another moment. If you're lying, I'll find you. You have my word on that, witch. Max narrowed his eyes at Errol. A glimmer of a smile caught Errol's lips for a moment and skirted away. I'd expect nothing less. And with that, he was gone. Max picked her up and she didn't complain as he marched to his car. His car that had appeared at the park, already running. Her seat heater was even on. Galen assisted Mary while Gibson helped Rosemary load into their car. Renee would see to it that their aunt was taken care of, so Kendra let go of that particular worry. Have someone drive their aunt and Mary home, Gibson. Make sure they have what they need. And I want a guard on each of them. Gibson rubbed his face along her jaw, and the scent of her cats soothed her belly. You did great out here tonight. I'll get guards on them right away. Akio has assigned some of Jack's wolves, too. Don't worry about them. They'll be safe. Now you go home and get yourself better. I'm going to check on you first thing. Max hugged his brother briefly before relaying more instructions. Finally, he slid into the seat beside her, and without another word, shot off toward home. Max winced as the sounds of his wife throwing up, yet again, reached him. He paced, forcing himself to not go to her. She'd warned him the last time that she'd kill him if he didn't leave her the hell alone while she vomited. From the look in her eyes, he believed that threat. His cat was agitated. The scent of the wrong magic she'd drawn into herself hung in the air, acrid and stale. She stumbled from the bathroom and back into bed, where he'd tucked her after a hot shower. I think I'm done. She burrowed down beneath her blankets and he settled in behind her, his arms around her body, giving her warmth and, he hoped, comfort. God knew he needed some of his own after the day they'd had. His brother was a traitor and a group of witches had tried to kill his wife. He'd been there when bloody strips were torn into her skin. He'd been there when magic had sent her to her knees. He'd killed that night. It wasn't the first time, but it was close. Killing was rare for their people. He didn't feel guilty. In fact, he wished he'd killed them all for daring to harm Kendra. Yes, Tooth and Claude worked just fine, though he did concede Kendra's point about it really being a magical war. This was not a good sign, and he didn't think they'd seen the last of this mage situation. He'd just have to be ready when they came back at his family. He wished her father had at least faked being sorry, if for no other reason than to spare Kendra and Renee any more pain. Barring that, he was very sorry he hadn't killed Andrew and his bitch of a wife. He hated that she had gotten away felt as if he'd failed his woman on that end. You should have taken more energy from me tonight. He kissed her shoulder and she snuggled back into him. I hate that you're so sick. And I'm sorry Susan got away. I'm sorry your father is what he is. Max, I love you so much. Her words were drowsy, but the love pouring through their bond was clear and let him know she was on the mend. Earlier, the sickness she'd had to rid herself of had done something to their bond, had narrowed the stream of information and emotion back and forth. That had alarmed him nearly as much as the bloody welts. I needed to do it my way. I know how hard it was for you to allow that, and I thank you for it. She got away because her people came to rescue her. He's not important, and so they abandoned him. She hit me in the back of my head, and before this is over... I'm going to get some of my own back for that, and what she did to my sister and my mother. Using the jamboree and you to get energy to kill without it having been self-defense would have tainted my magic. I did draw from you, from the cats, from the air, the grass, the water, all the people around. 
but it was me siphoning off their magic that weakened them the most. I need to talk with Mary about it, about how easily their magic came to me. I think it's because it wasn't theirs to start with. It made me hella sick, but it weakened them and made me stronger. This is good to know for next time. Next time? Oh, hell no, Kendra. He broke off into a streak of curse-laced Spanish at how dangerous his wife's life might be if she haired off on some freaking warpath with these mages. No, next time. You're mine and I do not give you permission to throw your pretty ass in harm's way again. He caught sight of her quick grin. Her eyes were closed, and she lay totally relaxed against him. God, you undo me, you know that? Here I am with a bunch of shapeshifters, some witches, and my asshole father and two bad guy witches are in some clan, a high security prison of some sort, probably being interrogated at this very moment. It reads like a play, doesn't it? Or maybe a Tim Burton movie. I won't do anything that would endanger my cats. And they're my cats, Max. On top of that scene in the park, we took on your jamboree. It's my responsibility to protect them. My duty, and I will. I'd never forgive myself if I did something to purposely harm the cats. Even Beth is mine to protect. He smiled against her hair. And you're mine to protect, too. I know. Thank you for that. I'm sorry you had to kill. I'd never want that for you. Don't be sorry. It's one less threat to you, and he deserved it. It was self-defense, and I'd do it again. I don't think it's a coincidence that my ex-in-laws called my uncle looking for me on the same night that we find my father. Max's stomach churned. I spoke briefly with Gibson about this while you were in the shower and refusing to let me help. He paused. Carlos? Gibson has had Carlos's call log from his phone forwarded to his own. There were three quick calls to cell phones. One with an 857 area code, one with 617, and a last with 408. Are you kidding me? What is he doing calling Gilroy? Gibson is on it. He sighed heavily. If his brother was involved in this, it would be considered treason, and there was only one sentence for treason in Jamboree Law. Gibson is paying Carlos a visit tonight to see what we can find out. Gibson has been in contact with the hunter and his people from the clan, too. They're getting answers already. Those hunters are hardcore. I like that. Better than putting our heads in the sand and pretending everything is just fine. They're organized, or they seem so. Powerful, without a doubt, which is comforting. I didn't sense any lies from them, but my senses were messed up from the magic I'd taken in. Errol was telling the truth. Cleanly. I didn't sense even the tiniest bit of evasion from him at all. He's strong. My cat was impressed. I don't like that you might get dragged into something because of them, though. She turned to face him. I'm sorry. She kissed his chest over his heart. I'm sorry about Carlos, but you know I can't ignore this. And you don't want me to. Not really. I promise to leave the expert stuff to the experts, but this is about the survival of my people. Both of them now. I expect my fears about the mages knowing the power of the shifters is moot because of the involvement of your brother. If he's involved, I should say. He sighed. Carlos is involved. I can feel it to my bones. He has exposed us all, not just witches, but damn it, if these mages truly understand shifter magics, they will want to steal it. He groaned. I knew you'd been trying to protect me without me knowing it. Damn it, Kendra. You can't do this. She made that little pfft sound at him, and he found himself caught between annoyance and amusement. He loved that she wanted to protect him, loved that she'd thought of their cats earlier, had protected them, and understood her duty so well. But he didn't love how fragile she was, and how easily harmed. I can so. Go to sleep. We have a big day tomorrow, and we're both going to need rest. Gibson will call if there's an emergency. He wanted me to repeat that to you, so you'd rest knowing he'd let us know if anything big developed. He didn't say, but Carlos was with Gibson now. Their father had gone to supervise, urging Max to stay with Kendra. The distance between Max and whatever was going on between his father and brothers 
would most likely help Max in the future. Father to son, Cesar had asked to be the one to mete out any punishment, should it come to that. So he let himself go. Once her breathing had changed, let himself sleep with her at his side, safe and his. Chapter 17 Kendra woke up, sore and feeling a little hungover. Must have been that huge infusion of outside magical energy and the stuff she'd pulled from the mage. But the cuts in her arms had faded to red lines, and her power was back, humming in the pit of her stomach, stoked like a fire, warming her and keeping her focused. Why are you getting out of bed? Max spoke sleepily, and she didn't resist the urge to turn back and take a look at him, naked, warm, and staring at her like he was going to eat her up. The good way. Well, aren't you delicious? Come over here and taste, just to see. He slid the sheet back, and she saw how ready he was for that. Why, hello there, sailor. She moved back to him, unbuttoning and sliding out of the oversized shirt he'd helped her into the night before. Touching him brought her back to herself in ways she'd probably never be able to adequately describe. His skin against her lips, against her cheek, the warm, solid muscle against her bare skin. It brought her home every single time. It didn't matter that they'd most likely hear terribly sad details about his brother, about her father, and that mess. What mattered right then was that he was everything to her. His taste brought a soft moan from her lips. Her hips jutted forward, seeking more contact. Usually in charge, he let her take over, looking up at her as she rolled on top of him and kissed her way across scratchy cheeks, over jawbone, down his neck, pausing to breathe him in. Her cat stilled, curling up within, even as the woman felt the stir of his cat in response. I love to look at you. She kissed the hollow of his throat, arching back as he slid his palms up her thighs, the tips of his fingers brushed, quite deliberately, against her labia when he cupped her ass. Look your fill. I'm all yours. She smiled, sitting up. Forever. And then some, yes. A breath and he was inside her, where he belonged. The scent of her magic and his built between them as she rose and fell over him, as she took him into her body over and over, building the heat between them until, with his hands all over her, playing the ring and her clit, tugging, squeezing ever so gently, she came. Moments later, he pressed up, holding her down on him as he followed. Trying to catch her breath, she used him as her pillow, his cock still inside her while she rested. I could have lost you last night, he said very quietly. When you were hit, when the mage slammed that bolt into you, my cat took over. Logically, I agree with your statement about magic being the best defense against magic. But logic was nowhere near my heart when you stumbled, when the scent of your blood filled the air, and I felt, damn it, I felt you weaken. I would die to save you, you know that but I'd kill to achieve that, too. His voice rumbled through his chest, where she rested her head. The beat of his heart was steady and strong. I know. She did. She hadn't been insulted or angry the night before. She'd understood why he'd done it. I love you, and I love that you'd do anything to protect me. I just wish I hadn't come into your life when all this drama did. I hate that I'm part of this mess. He sat up and she let him move her body however he wanted to. He carried her into the bathroom and began to run the shower. Get your ass in there, he wore his grumpy face, which for some unknown, inexplicable reason, delighted her. Only if yours is right after mine, or I'm going to think you're mad at me. He got in, his body taking up nearly as much space in the stall as his presence did inside her. I am mad. Mad that you blame yourself for this fuckery. You know it's not about you at all. Bullshit. He snorted and she ducked under the spray. It's totally about me. My ex and his family. This whole thing with the mages, Carlos. It's all about me. He sighed and soaped her hair, kneading her scalp with strong, talented fingers. 
Not so. It's connected to you, but that doesn't make it your fault, or even about you in the sense you think it is. Carlos. She felt part of his pain over it and turned to hug him tight. I'm so sorry for that. I know that's not my fault and all, but I wish I could make it not happen. I wish he wasn't doing this. I hate that you're hurting from it. Aw, oh, babe, you're everything. I wish it wasn't happening, too, but it is, and I have to face it. Today. She got out, handing him a towel when he followed. I suppose one bright side is that it's spring break at school, and I have the day off. It's not quite five. Sorry I woke you up so early. He kissed her so thoroughly she got revved up all over again. Damn, you're good with that mouth. His grin made her knees rubbery. I am, and you taste so good, too. He moved toward her, and she leaned against the counter, watching. His phone rang, breaking the taut silence between them. Damn, she groaned. There goes my phone. Let's get this show on the road. Naked, but for the towel low slung around his hips, he grabs the phone and sent her a look over his shoulder. I will be eating your pussy later. We have a date. She laughed for a second until she saw the caller info on her phone. This is Kendra. Rosemary, calling from the clan building in Providence, sounded exhausted. Why don't you go ahead and come down here? I've sent the directions to Gibson. We found out a great deal since last night. Have you been home at all? Is your arm all right? You sound terrible. Her aunt gave a bone-deep sigh. Arm is fine now. Renee and Mary did something to me. I'm sore, but I can move it. I slept over at Mary's. She and I drove down about an hour ago because we couldn't sleep. It's bad. Yes, it's terrible. And I hate that you have to hear it. But I do. I'll get Renee, too. She dressed quickly, grabbing up her things as she phoned Renee. An apology for waking her so early was on her lips until her sister answered, clearly awake. Is it bad? Kendra swallowed deciding to hold back details until she was face to face with her sister. I'll be by to grab you shortly, Max interrupted. We will be by to grab her shortly. I'm having Gibson bring the SUV. He and I need to talk about Carlos on the way. She looked to Max, seeing the stress lines around his eyes, knowing he hurt. Did you hear that? He nodded. Renee spoke again. Galen just came in and told me the same gruff bit about all of us going. I'll bring coffee. You rock. Love you. She hung up. Tell me. She grabbed her coat and Max helped her into it, pausing to breathe her in, letting her scent settle him even just a small amount. That she cared so much, especially after some of his family had been so unwelcoming to her, meant a lot. Sometimes it blew him away that the joy of holding this woman against his body was something he'd never imagined at this time the year before. Life was fucking odd sometimes. Max opened the door. Gibson's outside. Let's go and he'll brief us. Since we're in charge and everything. She made a face and shook her head. I keep forgetting that part. The drive wasn't long, and in the pre-dawn hours, it wasn't too crowded either. Max gave the order to Gibson to brief Galen and Jack on the Carlos situation as well. Kendra sat curled into his side, warm and soft, their connection wrapping around him and easing some of his anxiety, some. Jack drove while Gibson spoke. Carlos tipped them off last night. He gave them not only your home address, Max, but Mom and Dad's address. Kendra tensed and a growl trickled from her lips. His cat responded until Max wrestled his control back into place. It gets worse. How the fuck can it get worse than my brother hanging my wife and family out to dry? He set us up. Set my wife up to be killed. Galen pulled Renee closer and Kendra squeezed his hand briefly, before settling back into Max's arms. What else? Max asked. He's the one who told them, the mages, about Renee. Jack nearly got them into an accident at that. Get your fucking mind on the road or don't drive the car. Kendra sat up straighter, and right before Max's eyes, she owned her alphaness totally. I know you're pissed off. I am too. 
But what will it solve to have a cowardly, self-loathing prick like Carlos cause you to kill us all? You're an alpha wolf, Jack. Revenge will be yours. He sighed, but the sound was precariously close to a growl. Renee kissed his cheek and rolled her eyes at Kendra. Be nice. He was just shocked. Gibson began to speak again after a bracing sip of coffee. It was Jack. Or rather, it was when she made it with Jack and Galen. It pushed Carlos over the edge he'd been walking for years. Kendra's voice was clipped, businesslike. What part did my ex-in-laws play? He met them at some gathering. They're quite active in the anti-shifter movement and were talking about you, about how they'd held you in their basement. Chained. Gibson paused, his jaw clenched, as Max saw spots of rage. They chained you, bebe? Kendra blinked back tears. Yes. What else did he say? Renee turned to her sister, tears in her eyes. Max saw it and shook his head to stay her. The last thing Kendra needed just then was to have them all upset on her behalf. She was barely holding on as it was. Gibson met Max's gaze for long enough that they agreed to take care of this little problem very soon. He didn't know it was you they were talking about, not until you came into Max's life. I did a background check on you and your aunt when you first got to town. He overheard me reporting to my father and Galen. He knew it was you when I said your ex-husband's name. He got back in contact with his friends in the movement, as he called them, and eventually they hooked up and he led them straight to you. Well, first to Renee, with the help of Susan and your father, Ren. I'm sorry, but they were part of all this from the start. I had his place swept, took all the electronics, all his files, cleaned out his car, his desk at work, his everything. Part of this started a week ago. As Max knows, we've suspected Carlos for a while. Just not this. He told us everything anyway. We have names and numbers, Jack. You and I need to decide to share or not with Errol. The anti-paranormal groups are working together now with self-titled bounty hunters of all sorts. These mages painted themselves as humans out to drain witches of their demon-possessed magic. There are those who hunt shifters and those who poison vampire blood supplies with holy water. The witches need to know. Kendra seemed to come out of a dream. Her entire world had been torn from around her, but she had to get over it and lead. They have to know. The shifters need to know. The vampires? Fuck me, there are vampires. She shook her head. They need to know, too, because we have to fight back. Gibson's gaze went to Max, and she snarled, putting herself between them. I am Alpha, too. I gave an order, and I won't have you patting me on the head and waiting for my husband to give you permission to obey me or not. I'm either in charge, or I'm not. Max's brows flew up, but he shrugged. She's right. I won't give orders on things I don't understand, and I won't be a despot. But I am a witch, and this is genocide. I won't sit by and let my people, jaguars, withhold information that could save us all. Gibson nodded. You're right. Poppy was there, you said? How is he? Gibson looked at his brother. How do you think he is? He's angry. He's grieving. He's worried about Kendra and Renee. He hates that this happened and feels responsible. He had to carry out the sentence which tore him apart. But he told me it was his duty. He expects you both to be around later today. They've called an all-jamboree meeting, and you'll need to tell everyone. Kendra didn't want to ask what carrying out the sentence meant. She had a feeling she knew, and she didn't want to think about it. I think we should send your parents on a trip, send them to Kingston or Seville. Just let them grieve and heal, but out of the glare of attention. She spoke softly to Max, who took in a deep breath and then sighed. Good idea. I'll get my assistant on it. You're going to need an assistant, too. Running the jamboree will take a lot of your time, and you'll need the help. She nodded, numb. The clan building in Providence was as pretty as the ones around it. It looked like any other office building, but when they got to the doors, Miles was there to let them in. Silently, they rode an elevator up several floors to a reception area where Rosemary and Mary were waiting. The rest was sort of a blur. They were ushered into a conference room where some food and coffee had been laid out. 
a sleek, beautiful woman in her early thirties, stood and moved to them. I'm Sidira Rodas, leader of Clan Rodas. Please be welcome. She shook hands, her gaze lingering on Errol for just a few seconds longer than everyone else. Not that Kendra could blame her. The hunter was in fact a very fine-looking man. I'm afraid we have some distressing news. Please sit down and have some coffee or juice. There are bagels and other things. Mary reminded me about shifters needing protein, so the covered platters have eggs and bacon. Rosemary sat, holding Renee's hand on one side and Kendra's on the other. I'll do most of the talking. It's easier this way. Carlos de la Vega has been selling information about you and the shifters to these radicals. When no one looked surprised, Rosemary sighed. You knew? Kendra nodded. We only just found out. I've advised Gibson to cooperate and share information with Errol and the other clans. We're being targeted. We need to protect ourselves. Sadira nodded. Yes, thank you. Rosemary began again. Andrew was a bit player, in this anyway. He didn't really know much. The other two did. As we discovered last night, Andrew had been working with the mages for some time. His memories were spotty, and it appears they'd messed with him too. In the plus column, I think Mary and I have the key to unlocking Renee's memories totally. Though we might want to continue doing this slowly, because I worry about the emotional and mental trauma that may come from a rush of bad memories. Renee leaned into Jack. Good grief. Yeah. Your mother had always been suspicious, so she got you out of there. She went back to protect your whereabouts, Kendra. But eventually she ended up pregnant. This part is garbled. But it may not have been consensual. She had you, Renee, and Susan became a far more dominant force in his life. They stole magic from your mother and sold it to these other mages. Susan appears to have used the magic herself. Your father learning how later. He got stuck. Stuck was magical slang for an addict. Indeed. He's rather eaten up inside from it. That's how I could get in so easily. Why would they let him of all people come out here then? If he's so fucked up and all, why let him come instead of someone who was stronger? Galen sat next to Renee, his arm around her. He's expendable. Mary spoke from the other end of the table. It could be that they underestimated your strength. They don't know you're taking lessons from me. I've kept a low profile in Boston, and they certainly haven't paid me much attention. They killed our mother. Mary sighed sadly. They did. She directed a great many personal wards, and over time, Susan couldn't get anything out of her. Killing her was the way to free everything left over. I doubt your mother would have imagined they'd actually kill her. She was smart, your mother. Smart enough to ward Renee with her own blood. The wards she has are bone deep, which is what kept her alive, I'd wager. But even just a decade or two ago, this sort of targeting for theft of magic, killing for it, wouldn't have been commonplace. These thieves' numbers have only recently begun to rise. And unfortunately, Carlos de la Vega has given them enough information that they've leapt years ahead in intelligence gathering. Errol spoke, looking at Max. I'm sorry about this. I'm sorry to have to reveal this to you. No one should have to deal with the betrayal of family. No, they shouldn't. But that's all on Carlos, and he won't be a threat to anyone again. Max and Errol shared a moment of understanding. Kendra leaned her head on Max's shoulder for a moment, and his cat eased back a little. Rosemary looked to Renee. They killed your mother, found they couldn't kill you, and instead took you along, stealing your energy slowly over time. Just a year ago, they hooked up with a group of mages who attacked you. It wasn't until Carlos, until you made it with Jack and Carlos apparently got crazy angry and told these thugs all about you. They've got quite a racket, stealing magic, using the anti-paranormal movement to get their information on the whereabouts of witches ripe for their victimization. Worse, one of them became obsessed with you, instead of slowly siphoning. And this is what happened each time you had one of your mental breakdowns. It was your body's way of shutting down and trying to protect itself from them. He went rogue and decided that killing you would be his way of not only taking your power, but possessing you in the bargain. Mary turned those pale green eyes to Kendra. 
And you they didn't bargain for at all? Not until again, Carlos. When Renee confronted Andrew and Susan about you, they panicked and bolted. They're in trouble with their so-called friends who want you so badly. They want us all. Errol sat forward. Question is, how do we handle them? Kendra looked to Max, who gave her a narrowed glare but broke off with a sigh. We fight. You have our jamboree behind you. After all, we're threatened too, and Kendra is our alpha now as well. Jack nodded. And the wolves. I spoke briefly with Cade Warden, the National Pack Alpha, and he's given me the green light to cooperate with you. Gibson sat back in his chair and eyed them all. Well then, let's get this show started, shall we? Kendra and Max have to attend a meeting tonight where they must inform our cats one of their own has betrayed them. My parents will need some time away, and yet, time is of the essence. Step one is getting witches on board and training them all, Sadira looked to Kendra. You know you're going to stir a lot of anger and fear. There will be success, too, but also estrangement and accusations. Witches love drama. Some will embrace that instead of the harsh realities we offer. Kendra shrugged. Fuck em. We have to be strong or become meat. I have no intention of becoming meat for anyone. Max took her hand, kissing it. We'll fight, and we'll win. This is Tanya Eby. We hope you have enjoyed this unabridged production of Revelation, a De La Vega Cats novel by Lauren Dane. This program was produced by Common Mode. Paul Fowley, Technical Director. Executive Producer, Suzanne Mitchell. Text Copyright, 2017 by Lauren Dane. Production Copyright, 2017 by Harlequin Enterprises Limited. Used under license with Harlequin Books, S.A. All rights reserved. Thank you for listening. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.